Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Lady, I work here. Let go of me. Hey there, Mr. Reddit. I'm a huge fan of your videos. I honestly never thought I'd meet an entitled person at my job, but here I am. I work at a coffee kiosk inside of a gym. It's pretty small, but the pay is good, and I make a lot of tips. Upper class neighborhood. We've got the entitled mom. Innocent kid. They weren't a part of this. Front desk person. General manager, who happens to be my dad. And me, Magic Elephant. I work alone during my shifts, as the space is too small for more than one person. Every cabinet, fridge, has a lock on it. This is important later. It's so small that I can bend to get something from the mini fridge. I have to crouch. This morning I was opening up the kiosk and just generally setting up for the day. I had already made the coffee, set out our baked goods, and gotten our smoothies ready. I was crouched down so I could unlock the fridge. It's important to note that the key for this fridge looks like a small metal rod and you insert it and turn it so that you can unlock the fridge. I was having some trouble opening it. The lock had gotten stuck due to some ice and I ended up having to dislodge it by gently shaking the fridge. All of a sudden, I heard a loud, What are you doing? I quickly looked up to see what was wrong. Then I saw her. Karen. The destroyer of businesses, the asker of managers, the queen of the PTA. Karen was glaring at me angrily. Are you trying to steal? She screamed at me. Harsh, but okay. What? No, I work here. Do you think I'm stupid? I saw you breaking into that safe. I internally cringed, knowing this wouldn't end well. No, ma'am. I do really work here, and this fridge is stuck. If you look at my back, I have the logo on my shirt. I'm required to wear it as uniform. I turned around to show her the logo. Suddenly, I felt her grab me by the collar, choking me as she tried to drag me out from behind the desk. Let go! You're choking me! Karen yanked me up towards the front desk. I am on the floor, trying not to swallow my tongue. The front desk had heard the yelling at this point and came over to see what was wrong. The front desk likes me because I give them free coffee in the morning. Ma'am, is everything okay here? No, this jerk is trying to steal. Front desk not believing her. Uh, OP, is this true? No, I'm just trying to open- He's lying! I saw him! Keep in mind, she's screaming at this point, and the whole gym can hear. At this point, the general manager, my dad, comes to see what's wrong. OP, are you okay? What's with the yelling? Let him go! Karen let go of my shirt and stood up to try and defuse the situation. I really didn't want to lose my job. This kid was stealing from the safe behind that desk. I know that's not true, because he one, works here, and two, he's my son, and I know he wouldn't do that. You're probably just covering up for the little crap. Ma'am, if you do not calm down, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <coughs> Karen tried to take a swing at me. Thank God I know how to dodge. The general manager ended up pinning her arm behind her back until security showed up, who then dragged her out the door, kicking and screaming that I was a thief and they were just covering up for me. I don't know what happened to her after, but if I find out, I'll make an update. My dad said he would explain everything to my boss so I wouldn't get fired. Thank God. And because of all this screaming, a lot of people stopped at my kiosk to ask what happened, and I ended up getting a lot of tips because of it. Thanks, Karen. Edit. Because some of you asked how Karen was able to drag me, I'm very short and small, so it's not that hard to pick me up. Next up we've got Tales from Retail, Customer Service, Entitled Mom Commits Check Fraud. Hey Mr. Reddit and Re-Army, 
been listening to you for some time and thought I would post some stories about my time with the customer service call center. Also, I apologize about formatting and spelling. English is first language, etc. So for about three years, I worked for a company. We will call it a Krapika. This place is a call center that handles multiple clients. The client I worked for was a major grocery wholesaler for the nation, USA, that also had a lot of retail stores. So for this day, I was working at check adjustments, basically fixing checks a customer writes at a store that a cashier messed up. This happened a lot. One check even being messed up for over 132,000 US dollars. Yikes. When a customer called because she was having trouble paying with a check at one of our stores. The cast. We've got entitled mom. And me, the overworked and underpaid teddy bear, Fragingston. The call starts with me giving my opening. Thank you for calling the store. My name is Fragingston, and how can I help you today? Yes, I am having some trouble cashing a check at your store. Okay, I can look into why you're having trouble using a check at our store. May I have your information to look you up in our system? I will also need your routing, account, and check number you tried to use. SOP for our company, as our program used for searching up customers sucked. Entitled Mom gives her information to me and I thank her. Thank you for your information. Give me a few minutes to look you up in our systems and I will be right back. I'm just going to put you on a quick hold. She gives me a quick sigh and just said, Okay, in the most disgust tone. Just make it quick. I have crap to do and this cashier is so stupid. No, she called from the store phone in front of the cashier as she did not have a cell phone. So I had just put her on hold and began to look her up. After a few minutes, I was able to locate her and noticed that she had cashed a lot of checks in the past few days. Over eight checks totaling about 4,000 US dollars. Now the system will only allow seven checks in a one week time for any customer and had a limit for about $500 for the week. But the lady had done the impossible, somehow. So with this many checks, I pulled another program that checked the status of the checks if they had cleared or if they came back as NSF, non-sufficient funds, aka bounced checks. And guess what? All eight of the checks were NSF. Now our company takes check fraud very seriously and SOP for that is to forward all information to the local law enforcement of the area, but only after verifying if it is fraud and on whose side. Don't want to make any mistakes now, would we? Now, there's no real good way about asking a customer if he or she is committing check fraud, and I had always took a blunt approach to it, so I take her off hold. I'm sorry, I'm cut off. Now you listen here, jerk. I have crap to do and kids to feed, so you need to take this check and leave me the heck alone. Not like you can do your crap job anyway. You probably have this job to pay for your drug habit, nasty girl. <coughs> I was taken back by this, not because I haven't heard stuff like this before, but was just not expecting it. Also, just as a note, she was talking to the cashier, not me. Um, miss? I'm sorry to hear about the wait, but thank you for holding. About darn time you got back? I got crap to do and need this taken care of now. Again, I do apologize about that. So I was able to look you up in our systems and have located the issue. It looks like you wrote about eight checks at different store locations across the city, totaling about 4,000 US dollars. Are you aware of this? Yes, I had to buy food and other things for my daughter's birthday party. She only gets the best. Okay, well, the checks you cashed before have not cleared yet due to NSF, and the only way for you to pay with another check is to pay off the outstanding balance of $4,000 plus 200 for check fees. I can provide you the information to the department to pay the outstanding balance. At this time, I am thinking, wow, this lady is an idiot, but oh boy, does it get better. Oh, well, my bank will just pay it because I have been with them for a really long time, so that should not be the problem and I should be able to use my check. I'm thinking to myself, really? What loopy land do you live in, lady? Uh, no, miss. The funds are not in your account, thus the NSF return on the checks you wrote. You will have to write the funds in your account in order to pay, 
and until you do, you will not be able to use a check at our or any other store as the system has flagged you for non-payment. Can't you just let me pay now? Just this once? Are you going to ruin my child's birthday? Sorry, miss. I can't do that as it's against protocol and company policy. Oh my god! You are ruining my child's birthday. She needs these things or she is going to die. You should die because you are ruining her birthday. You should end yourself, you fat, stupid idiot. I mean, wow. This lady is telling me to end myself because I'm ruining her daughter's birthday party? I'm just wow at this moment and I have had enough. Miss, I should inform you that if you do not calm down, I will have to disconnect the call. She tried to cut me off again at this point, but I'm not having it. Now you listen here. No. Now you listen here, miss. If you do not calm down, I will disconnect this call and I will be calling local law enforcement and forwarding your information as this is check fraud, meaning you will do some time in jail. She hangs up on me, but not before calling me some very not nice things. So at this point, I'm just glad she's off the phone and I begin filling out my case report with all her information. All of this information was more than enough to find and put this lady away behind bars and I sent it off to my manager and to local law enforcement. However, this story does not have a happy ending. Well, not that I know of. I never found out if she got caught or is still pulling this crap. I like to think that she served hard time for this. Some people just don't care and are just so entitled. I do have a lot of other stories about entitled people and others. Remind me to tell you about Mr. Anonymous, but I'll save that for another time. Thanks again for reading this, and thanks Mr. Reddit for all that you do. I love listening to you and the stories that everyone else posts here. And our final story of the day. Entitled kid thinks I should do their job, parent agrees. Hey Mr. Reddit, I've been watching your videos for a while. They're awesome, keep up the good work and I hope I can make it on one of your episodes. English is my first language, but I'm on mobile, so yeah, excuse any mistakes. Cast, we've got me, the one and only. We've got the entitled kid, the entitled mother, awesome camp leader, security guard, and the other kid. Background info. I was 13 at the time of this story. Every summer, I work for a summer camp where the first half you do art and the second half the kids swim. I work in the art area and in that area we expect the kids to do one and only one job, which is after they use a paintbrush to clean it in the sink. If you're an artist or someone who at least paints every once in a while, you might already know this, but if you're not, basically if you don't clean out the brush, it hardens and it's hard to use. Okay, so enough said, let's get on to the story. It was the first day and since I'm 13 in this story, it was my second year doing this. I'm 15 now and I was already used to doing this. My job is to pour paint, since all the kids are age five to 10 and we don't really trust them with the paint. And also I help the kids. And like I said already, their only job other than working on their art is to clean their brushes. Now entitled kid, I wanna say she was about eight, was painting the same picture as about five other kids were. I was going around helping the other kids and entitled kid raised her hand and I went to go help her. The following conversation happens. Can you wash my brush for me? Sticking the brush in my face. Okay, allowing it this one time. Two minutes later. Can you wash my brush for me? Once again, sticking it in my face. No, I'm helping other kid right now. You can wash your own brush. But this is your job. You get paid for it and I don't. So do your job. Remember what Awesome Leader said, the only job a camper has to do is clean their brushes. I don't care. You will clean my brush now. I don't care what Awesome Leader said. Note, Awesome Leader was five feet away. Now after pulling this stunt, Entitled Kid got punished by having to spend the first 15 minutes of pool time sitting in a chair. The end. Psych. The next day, the mom came in with a classic Karen haircut. The following conversation happens. Excuse me? My darling angel said one of your workers was rude to her. Awesome leader. Um, ma'am? Actually, your kid was being rude to her. 
and he points to me. My daughter said she made her clean brushes. Because that is what she is supposed to do. Shouldn't the worker do that? Pointing to me. Actually, I don't get paid. I'm a volunteer. Now I get paid, but back then I didn't. Ah, my daughter shouldn't have to do any work unless it's artwork. Me and awesome leader start laughing. Why are you laughing? Because you are so freaking entitled. Get out. Entitled mom slapped me across the face and tried to slap awesome leader, but I pushed her away. Security shows up. What's going on here? These two ladies assaulted me. They should be arrested. Security, knowing that awesome leader or me would never do that. I'll check the cameras. Five minutes later. I reviewed the tape, and ma'am, looking at Entitled Mom, you need to leave before I call the cops. She ran out of the place, and we never saw Entitled Mom or Entitled Kid again. Entitled Dad expects me to basically be his slave while I'm visiting, gets put in his place by Mom. Hey guys, long time reader, second time posting a story on Reddit, first time posting on this sub, hopefully I got it right this time. It's a bit of a long one, so I apologize in advance keeping it family friendly as possible. This happened a little over three years ago, but it's still fresh in my mind because it still gets me angry to this day. We've got the entitled dad, we've got mom, and me. Well, that should be obvious. First, some backstory. And yes, the entitled dad in question is in fact my own. I lived with my parents for most of my life. I was a bit of a deadbeat for a while, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe I'm wrong for thinking this, but that doesn't excuse my dad's behavior when it came to how he treated me. Now, I'm from Texas. I was raised to respect your elders and don't talk back, but I was also raised not to take any BS from anyone. This will come into play later because at this time, I didn't have anywhere else to go, so I didn't really have a choice. In 2013, I finally moved out of my parents' house for good to live with my now wife. I won't specify where for privacy sake, Let's just say I now live far enough away it requires a two-day bus ride just to visit. After three years away, I was getting a little homesick and I wanted to take a trip home to go see my family and my friends. So during a video chat with my parents, I asked if they had the money to buy me a bus ticket so I could come down and visit. They said sure and I made plans with them and my friends down there. My mom even offered to throw me a party since I was only staying for two weeks and my birthday was the month after. Two days and a long, boring bus ride later, I made it. I had even brought my PS4 with me so I could play some games while I was there. I'm a second generation gamer, both my parents are gamers as well. As well as stream, because they had the fastest internet and they told me I could. My dad immediately fell back into his old habit of basically trying to make me do everything around the house. I didn't have a problem with it when I was living with them because, again, I was 23 and living with my parents. By this point though, I was 25, married, I had gotten married the year before, was just visiting, and more to the point, didn't live there anymore. I basically told him as politely as I could that it wasn't my job to clean up his mess or help him with whatever project he decided to start while I was there. Needless to say, this did not sit well with him. But what was he going to do? Kick me out? One particular day, he came home from work to find me on my laptop, which I had brought with me so I could video chat with my wife while I was there. He basically threw a temper tantrum. Is that all you've been doing all day? Sitting on your butt on the couch on your computer? Uh, yeah? Thinking he had asked me to do something and I had forgotten it. You know you could have been cleaning up the house while I was at work. I've dealt with this for about a week by this point. I did clean up. I cleaned any mess I made. I shouldn't have to clean up you or anyone else's mess around here because A, I'm only visiting, and B, I don't live here. Well, you could have said, you know, Dad's at work all day, and when he comes home, he's exhausted. I'm going to clean up the house for him. Keep in mind, he had two other kids still living at home at this point, both at an age that shouldn't have a problem doing chores. Now, I would also like to point out that I had no problem cleaning up if I had been asked to. My mom had asked me a few times while I was there to do some cleaning because my sister, 
one of the kids still living at home, routinely left her baby at my parents' house while she went to go do God knows what with her baby daddy. My mom basically just told me to ignore him, so I did, thinking that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Remember that party I mentioned earlier? The one that I had been told was specifically for me? Yeah, turns out my dad had turned it into a party for himself. His birthday was the day I arrived. We planned it that way on purpose, so you'd think the party would be either that day or a day or two after, right? Wrong. They planned it a week into my visit. So basically, what happened was he took a party that was specifically stated to be for me and made it all about himself. I wasn't allowed to invite any of my friends or anything. To make matters worse, he took my phone during the party and told me I wasn't allowed on it. I was done. Another thing I should bring up is my friends. I made it clear before I even came to visit that I would also be hanging out with my friends while I was there. My dad did not like this because it cut into time I could have been spending being at his beck and call. Now when I still lived with them, my parents were the type, as long as I told them who I was with and when, if I'd be home that night, they didn't care what I did from age 18. So, thinking because I no longer lived there, I didn't have to do that anymore, I basically came and went as I pleased. I still had the courtesy to let my mom know where I would be since I was staying with them after all. My mom told me that while she appreciated the thought, I didn't live there anymore and was under no obligation to tell her where I was going or who I would be with. My dad, on the other hand, well, I'm sure you get the picture by now. The straw that broke the camel's back was the day before I was set to leave to go back home. My dad had basically been spending the day forcing me to help him with everything he could think of. Despite me telling him I had made plans with my friend Heath, who I had only hung out with once during the entire two weeks I was there. No! You've spent this whole time hanging out with your friends when you're supposed to be spending time with us. You're staying home today and helping me with stuff around the house. Next time you want to come down to visit, have one of your friends pay for your ticket if you're going to do that. I basically ignored him and my mom told me not to worry about it. When Heath showed up, I basically dropped what I was doing and left. As I was walking away, my dad went on a rant about how I was supposed to be spending this time with my mom and not my friends. Keep in mind that despite being told I wasn't required to stay at home at any point, I had been spending nights and early mornings with my mom when she couldn't sleep and came into the living room where I was sleeping to watch TV. I have insomnia, so most of the time I was either awake or not asleep enough that she would be bothering me. I also spent her days off with her unless one of my friends wanted to hang out. I also, despite what he would have you believe, did not leave every day to hang out with my friends. My friends are busy people, either having jobs, kids, or in a couple of cases, both. So I regularly spent my days at the house either on my PS4 or my computer. My dad's attempt to guilt me into staying because I hadn't spent enough time with my mom was the last straw for her. I had left by this point but the look I saw her give him before I left told me she was about to tear into him. I even told my friend Heath this, he knows all about it. From what she told me when I got back, the conversation went something like this. What the heck are you talking about? He needs to be spending time here, not hanging out with his friends. He spent most of his days here. I know because when I come home, she got home before him. He's usually sitting on the couch on his computer or PS4 and you trying to drag me into it was low. Well, he needs to be helping around the house. I can't do it by myself. He doesn't live here. You have two kids who still live here. Make them get off their butts and do chores. I didn't hear a peep out of him about hanging out with my friends for the rest of the day or the next before I left. Entitled Dad expected me to be his slave for two weeks when I came to visit. He tried to use my mom as blackmail. He got put in his place by my mom. Next up we've got Entitled Family Attempts to Dog Nap My Sister's Service Dog. So, this is the second of my three encounters with entitled parents that relate to my little sister's service dog. Sorry it took so long to get out. More issues with my mom have risen lately and I am a single potato caring for two needy tater tots. I do have two other stories. The first that explains how I came into custody of my beautiful little sisters after my parents were allowing the elder of the two 
to be hurt for six years, and the other a brief encounter with an entitled parent who didn't believe my sister needs a service dog because she has mental illnesses. I'll link them at the bottom for convenience. I'm also far from the best storyteller, as well as writing in general, so bear with me. It's also long. I'll be using the same false names for my sisters that I've used for all of my other stories. Amy, who is 17, and Liza, who is 8. I'm their elder brother, and I'm 29, and this all takes place in Australia. Now, as briefly mentioned in my other entitled mom story, I do my best to get Amy outside for at least an hour a day, and this normally involves taking her service dog for a leisure walk as a family, which she enjoys and is accustomed to at this point. On this particular day, a new playground had just opened up nearby, so I thought it might be fun to take my girls somewhere different, and as Amy likes to play fetch with Lickety Split, her service dog, who is a cross between a purebred German Shepherd and a mutt, I made sure to look into the rules regarding off-lead dogs. As a service dog, she's pretty much allowed everywhere if she has a lead and a vest on and isn't disturbing the peace. There was a nearby field where off-lead dogs were permitted, but the play area around the playground only allows on-lead dogs, which is normal for my area. So, armed with doggy doo-doo bags, sunscreen, water, and lickety splits vest and lead, we drive down to the new park. New areas do make Amy anxious, so we walk around a bit to help her get an understanding of where everything is. And during this time, Lickety Split has her vest and lead on, dutifully walking at Amy's pace like the best doggo she is. As there are quite a few little kids around, and we don't want them distracting her, but most seem to understand what Lickety Split's vest means. However, one kid in particular, whom we'll dub Little Entitled Girl, does approach and ask to play with Lickety Split. Amy has selective mutism, she can't talk in certain, most, situations. I take the duty to explain that Lickety Split is working right now and can't be distracted, but I point to the field and say we might be playing there later if Amy feels up to it. She normally doesn't mind other people throwing the ball, as long as they don't actually touch Lickety Split or her. Little entitled girl huffs and says that dogs are for playing, not working. I ask her if she's ever seen police dogs on TV or anything, to which she hesitantly replies, yes and I explain those are a different type of working dog. Lickety Split's job is to take care of my sister because she gets frightened very easy and her dog makes sure she doesn't get hurt if she gets scared. The little entitled girl then turns to Amy, who's getting a bit fidgety and keeps tugging on my shirt, her silent signal that she wants to move away from this, while Lickety Split is in her alert stance when she has a feeling something around could trigger Amy or cause her harm. The little entitled girl then throws her arms up and shouts, Boo! Which of course causes her to jump and hide behind me, starting to cry. Amy, even to this day, is very timid and doesn't cope well in strange environments with loud noises or sudden movements towards her. The little entitled girl then starts laughing at Amy and calling her names. Liza, who is very protective of her big sister, then pushes the girl and scoffs her for being so mean and I decide that we've all had enough of this girl and hurry my sisters along so we can find somewhere for Amy to calm down in peace. We find an area out of sight from the little entitled girl and I sit Amy down on a bench in the shade where I can work towards calming her down before deciding if we should just go home. Thankfully, she wasn't too bad as far as her anxiety attacks go, just breathing heavily, hot, and she was crying quietly. I asked her if she wanted to go home, but she declined and asked if we could just stay away from the little entitled girl because Liza still wanted to play in the playground and said she didn't want Lickety Split off her lead. I'm hesitant but agree, knowing that because Amy is trying to overcome her anxiety, she does sometimes want to push herself out of her comfort zone and I would just have to keep a close eye on her and make sure she isn't pushing herself too far. The next little while is quiet, Liza playing in the playground while Amy and I sit in the shade while Lickety Split laying beneath the bench and Amy reading a book. As you'd expect, more kids came to ask to give pets to our dog, but I politely turned them away with no issues. No little entitled girl or so I thought. Little entitled girl comes running up to Amy and me with her mother in tow, jabbing her finger at me while blabbering about animal abuse. Now, most of my attention was on my sister rather than what this lady was saying, so the conversation isn't exactly word for word. This also took place months ago. The mother looks me up and down as if I had no business being in the area. My suburb is the next one over and considered slightly higher class, and asks if Lickety Split is my dog. 
I explain how Lickety Split is in my name, but she is registered as Amy's service dog. In Australia, if you are under 18, parents or guardians are considered the owner of dogs, even if a registered service dog is serving a minor. When she turns 18, Lickety Split ownership will be transferred to Amy. The parent gave me a look as if I had hit her child. She then snarls at me something along the lines of, How dare you make an innocent animal work and brainwash it into being able to do nothing more than follow your demand. I just shrug and tell her that she's entitled to that opinion and ask her to leave as she was upsetting Amy. She then demands that I hand the dog over to her as a dog as spectacular looking as mine should not be forced into slavery. I give her a simple, nope, and wave her off. She leaves, surprisingly, with her daughter and complaining about how she wants a dog that is well behaved enough to sit like Lickety Split is. About half an hour passes and we were packing up to leave. Amy quietly asks if we can throw the ball just a little for Lickety Split because she doesn't feel it's fair for her dog to miss out on the fun. So we head back to the field, remove Lickety Split's lead and vest after checking little entitled girl or her mother weren't around. Side note, her dog tags also say that she is a service dog as well as have my name, address, and phone number on them, and this will be important later. And we begin a small session of fetch with Lickety Split, taking turns throwing the ball as we usually do. Now the park is set up, so the field is right next to the car park with a row of bushes separating the two, and the area we were standing in had a few trees shading some picnic tables. As Liza is taking her turn to throw the ball, it hits a tree and bounces through the bushes. Lickety chases after it, and I tell my sisters to stay put while I follow just to make sure she doesn't end up on the road. Despite Liza's throw not being too hard, Lickety Split wasn't directly behind the bushes like I thought she would be. In fact, I couldn't immediately find her after passing the bushes. I looked around for a moment before hearing Lickety Split's distressed barking and bolt into the car park, finding a family of five attempting to wrestle Lickety Split into the back of their car. The family, including Little Entitled Girl, her mother, father, a boy, most likely middle child, and an older girl, appeared to be the oldest. The father was holding Lickety Split's jaw shut while the children were attempting to move her into the trunk of their car. My dog was not making it easy for them, and since the mother seemed to refuse to get close and the father was fighting to keep her head under control, they were struggling quite a bit. I yelled at them to let Lickety Split go, and several things happened in quick succession. The entitled father lost his grip on Lickety Split's head while the two girls jumped back, leaving brother holding her hind legs off of the ground. Lickety Split barked several times before the entitled father again tried to hold her muzzle, which she responded to by biting his arm and flinging herself at the boy, snapping at him until she managed to land a bite on his ankle and bolt to my side. I grabbed her collar and yelled at the family for attempting to steal my dog. At this time, a security man arrived explaining how someone had reported an incident and asked what was going on. At this time, Amy and Liza had also come looking for me, most likely hearing the barking and yelling, as well as just wondering why I was taking so long. Amy was on the brink of a panic attack, and Lickety strained against my grip to get to Amy, so I let her go, telling Amy and Liza to quickly put her vest and lean back on. The father is now yelling at security about how they had found what they assumed was an abandoned dog that they were planning on taking to a shelter to adopt the poor thing when I appeared and beat the dog until she was so scared it bit him and his son and he now demanded the dog to be put down immediately. Security looks over at Lickety Split who was taking a defensive stance in front of my sisters and snarling at the family before looking at me and asking what my side of what happened was. Thinking this could take a while, I asked him to hold on a moment while I moved my sisters and Lickety Split off of the road and into the shade. Amy is having a panic attack at the prospect of her dog being put down and sobbing for me to protect her dog. At this point, I just wanted to get her home where it was much easier calming her down, so I turned back to security and the family and explained the misthrown ball, how I had come to make sure my dog didn't end up on the road and how I found the family attempting to steal my sister's service dog when the entitled mom interrupted, screeching how, That's proof he abuses the dog. No dog should be made to work. Security then pauses before he states his grandma has a guide dog because she's going blind. Pause from the family. Security turns to the kids and asks if they were trying to move the dog in the car. The older girls confirm this. Security then asks if they waited to see if anyone claimed the dog. The girl shook her head, and the entitled mom then claimed the dog had no tags. 
I point out Lickety Split's beautifully handmade bright purple and blue collar, stating it has my phone number and address on it, before asking security if I could take my sister's home. I didn't even care about pressing charges for the attempted dog napping, I just wanted to get Amy home as she was really struggling to calm down. Thankfully, security understood, took my details, and explained this would most likely go to the police as my dog had bitten two people. I wasn't too worried about this as my state's law says that if a dog bites or attacks someone, it would be put down unless it was provoked to do so. He would make sure to save all security footage as evidence as he could clearly see I cared for my dog and family. He let me go but warned me that Lickety Split must be kept in my name and her residence can't change or it would have worse legal repercussions. I assured him we weren't going anywhere before ushering my sisters to my car to get home. I left the car park and drove to another at a sports field close by before trying to calm Amy down, going through our normal method of grounding her before giving cuddles and talking her down from her panic attack. She's still shaky when I pulled away, but I wanted to get her home where she could lie down and relax, so she just cuddled the toy she had brought and her dog the whole way home while crying softly. Amy normally sits in the back seat with Lickety Split and Liza no matter where we are going. We ended up ordering from a restaurant, Amy's favorite, for dinner and watching a movie together snuggled up on the pull-out lounge. The girls both fell asleep there and I let them be. This was before Amy was back in school, but I gave the next off from her tutoring and worked from home since she was still upset. The police did get in contact with me about Lickety Split biting two people but confirmed they had seen the security footage and agreed that the situation had provoked Lickety Split to do so. There was also a whole court procedure where the family was adamant the attack was unprovoked and they were just trying to help what they thought was a stray dog, but one of the cameras had caught a very clear display of Lickety Split's collar, which has my phone number. Not to mention, Entitled Mom and Little Entitled Girl had seen me and my sister twice that day, which cameras had also caught. The parents were fined and given community service, and since I just wanted it to be over, I didn't press further, but we haven't been back to that park since. Let my kids pet your wolf. Hey guys, was going to post another entitled parent story about my pregnancy adventures, but a recent trip to the dog park reminded me of something that happened last year. Going off of memory, so please pardon me for any mistakes. Cast is me, entitled dad, my husband, Kid 1 and Kid 2. On mobile, so pardon for any small grammar or spelling mistakes. Me and my husband have two dogs. We love our dogs as much as we will love our child. After a lot of searching, saving, and hoping, we each finally got our dream dogs. My husband got his black Labrador, and I got my Alaskan Malamute. Now, some things about Malamutes, which is important to know for this incident. Malamutes take great resemblance to Siberian Huskies but they are larger and have a lot more muscles. They do resemble wolves, but trust me, you can tell they are not wolves. Malamutes can get up to over 100 pounds. They are large teddy bears and love people. I adore my dog and love to cuddle up with him. Anyway, back to the story. My husband and I took our dogs to the park to let them run off some energy. Our lab loves to run, play fetch, and jump around on the play equipment set up for dogs to play on. My dog. He does his own thing, wanders around, runs laps when he feels like it, and overall just chills out. The dog park is very large and the perfect place for our dogs. My husband was on the other side of the park with our lab, and I was on the opposite, following my fluffy boy around where I hear voices. Kid 1 Wolfie, look, it's a wolfie. Over at the fence is entitled Dad, Kid 1, and Kid 2. The kids, I'm guessing were between five and seven years old, both boys. My boy, noticing them, happily prances over and starts sniffing them through the gate. He loves people. I wanna pet the wolf. I walk over with a smile on, trying to be polite. The entitled dad was a large, beer belly, going bald, typical looking dad, if I had to guess late 30s. Be careful, wolves can bite. I remember it being weird that, one, he seemed to say it in a worried voice, yet didn't pull his kids away, and two, that this adult couldn't tell this was a dog. Maybe he was just messing with his boys. Oh, he's not a wolf. He's a friendly doggy who loves attention. Entitled Dad snapped at me. No, I know a wolf when I see one. That's a wolf. Don't lie to me. 
my dog is still sniffing the kids through the gate, whining and wanting to be pet. No, sir, he's an Alaskan Malamute, not a wolf. I want to pet the wolfie. Nowadays, I happily let people pet him, but at the time, he wasn't quite a year old yet and we were still training him. He's almost 100 pounds and these were little kids. He can easily hurt them unintentionally. I'm sorry, but he's a pretty big dog. I don't want him to hurt you guys on accident. It's fine. They can pet him. The entitled dad starts to walk the kids towards the gate to enter the dog park. Sir, I'm not comfortable with him around little kids yet. We're still training him. My kids will be fine. Just shut up and keep him still while my kids pet him. <laughs> now I'm upset. Not only did this guy not even ask to pet my dog, but he seriously expected me to just hold on to my still in training 100 pound dog while he gets excited about meeting new people. I said no. Keep your kids out of the park. He can hurt them. Entitled Dad stopped and completely snapped at me. Listen, you dumb girl. If my boys want to pet your wolf, they can pet him. Just shut up and hold him. At this point, my husband heard the yelling and ran over with our lab, happily following along. You okay? What's wrong? This girl won't let my kids pet her wolf. My husband does not like confrontation in the slightest, but he is always quick to defend me. Do not speak to my wife that way. He is a large dog and we are still training him. If she says no, it means no. The entire time my husband is yelling, the kids keep trying to call our dogs over to them, but my husband grabbed our lab by his collar and I grabbed my Malamute, trying to keep him away from the gate. I tell my husband, forget this, we should just leave. Thankfully, his truck was on the other side of the park. No, my kids will pet the wolf. Husband looked at our fur babies. Boys, wanna race? Every time we say, wanna race, they perk up and run alongside husband, kind of as a game. We use it to get them to leave the park whenever we say, rather than drag them out when they don't wanna leave. My husband ran ahead with them to the truck while I hurried behind. I am very out of shape. The entitled dad was screaming and cursing while kid one and kid two cried. I really felt bad for them. They weren't mean or acting entitled, but I just couldn't let them pet my boy without fear of him accidentally jumping all over them and hurting them. We got them in the bed of the truck before Entitled Dad was even halfway through the park, still screaming. I can't remember where the kids were. We got in the truck and pulled away right as Entitled Dad reached the gate on our side of the park. I flipped him off as we drove away. We never saw them at the park again, thank God. It's our favorite place to take them to play. My boy has been trained up a lot now, took a long time since Malamutes are stubborn as heck, and now I have no problem letting kids pet him as long as I'm near him. Not the most exciting story, no cops called, never saw him again. Glad we never experienced that again at that park. If anyone knows how I can attach a picture of him to this story, let me know and I will. But his puppy picture is my profile pic. He was about six weeks old, taken by his breeder before we could bring him home. I'm still new to Reddit and figuring things out. Please, if someone says no to petting their dog, please take it as a no, especially if little kids are involved. My dogs are not vicious at all, but untrained large dogs can seriously hurt someone unintentionally if you don't listen to their owners. Thanks for reading. Also, for those saying I should have let him just play with them and let the kids get hurt to teach the guy a lesson, I didn't want to do it for two reasons. One, it wasn't the kid's fault the entitled dad was acting like a jerk, and I didn't want them hurt because of it. And two, I've had family lose dogs because of situations like this. All it takes is one call to the cops to start a case against us and run the risk of losing our dog because of his stupidity and refusal to listen. One little lie about him being aggressive can be all it takes. Next we've got Entitled Mom Tries to Take My Mystery Box Prize That I Won Fair and Square. So, some context. So the community center in my community held something called a jelly bean dance every third Friday of the school year. It was for ages 6 to 12, so grades 1 through 6. There would be an entry fee of $5, and then every item of food cost $1 each, including hot dogs, chips, pop, and chocolate. So bring $10 and you have dinner covered. With entry, you also got a raffle ticket that had a number. Every so often, during the dance, the DJ would call a few numbers out, and whoever had that number got a prize of the winner's choice. Now the prizes weren't cheap, they were pretty great. 
There were Barbies and Hot Wheels and Nerf guns and all that jazz. I lived in an upper middle class area, so that's why the prizes were so nice. So this is where Entitled Parent comes in. She ran the community center, she planned the dances and the prizes. She was also the head of the parent council at my elementary school, but those stories are for another day. But to make this long story a bit shorter, the mom would always take extra tickets and give them to her daughter, so she won a prize every single dance. I found this out years later. Cast, we've got Entitled Mom, Entitled Kid, me, the DJ, and Stepdad. Now to the story. It was 2010, I was 11, in grade six, and it was the dance before Halloween, and kids were allowed to wear costumes. I went as a dragon. There were a few different Halloween-themed prizes. I remember there was a Catwoman Barbie, a black cat Webkins, and even a pumpkin costume. But the prize everybody wanted was the mystery box. It was a big box covered in black wrapping paper, so no one knew what was inside it. No one except Entitled Mom, because she was the one who bought everything. Apparently this box was worth over $150. The night was fun. Everyone danced to the music and all got a sugar rush from the candy and pop and generally had a great time. Throughout the night, various names were called and the lucky winners got to choose their prizes. Then the final song came on. It was Fallen Leaves by Billy Talent. I always considered this my lucky song, even though the story behind the song isn't very happy because some good things happened to me whenever I heard it. I would find things I thought I lost or I'd get a good mark on a test, generally good things. So I felt good about my chances. The song ends and the DJ announces it's time to give away the mystery box. He called the numbers out. The tickets were similar with the numbers until the last three digits. This is where things got funny. The DJ said the third last number and a roar of no was heard. Second last number and you heard the same dramatic no and then the final no. I looked at my ticket to see that I had won the mystery box. I run to the front and show the DJ my ticket. He checks it over and it was indeed the ticket that had won. Then I noticed Entitled Kid standing beside me, waving her ticket in the DJ's face and whining. No, I have the right ticket. He looks at it and tells her, Sorry, but you don't. Better luck next time. She storms off crying to Entitled Mom. The DJ hands me my mystery box and tells everyone to have a good night and get home safely. The lights go on. There's a crowd of kids around me wanting to know what's inside it. I didn't want to open it until I got home because it was a big box. I told them that I'd tell them on Monday what was in it. I grabbed my coat and went outside to wait for my ride. I knew it was going to be either my mom or stepdad. As I wait just inside the door, the entitled kid comes over to me and tries to open my box. We are both 11 and in the same class. She, unfortunately, was one of my many bullies. I pull the box away and tell her to leave me alone. She starts whining again. Give me the box. I was supposed to win it. Mommy made sure of it. Me being polite said, Well, maybe you'll win the one next month. It's before Christmas, so it will be awesome. She whines some more about how she wants it. The entitled mom walks up to me and yells, You are not supposed to have this. Entitled kid was supposed to win it. Now, give it to her. Entitled mom was a huge lady. Tall and fat and kind of scary. I took my ground and I said, I won it. Besides, she wins every time. It's time to let someone else win for a change. Losing is a part of life. Yes, I, an 11 year old, said that. My great grandma would say it to me, in a nice way of course, one of her many life lessons. Entitled mom looked at me in shock. She then started to grab for my box. I held onto it as best I could and I yelled at her to let go of it. All the while, Entitled Kid was pounding on my back, trying to help her Entitled Mom. Suddenly, my stepdad walks through the doors to pick me up. What the heck is going on? Entitled Mom is trying to steal my box I won. No, you are trying to steal it from my Entitled Kid. You don't even know what's inside it. I do. Because it's a mystery box. I'm not supposed to know until I open it, and you bought the prize. I was looking at my stepdad. He's 6'6", and really scary looking. I was honestly scared because I thought he was going to make me give it to her. Being the child of the other man, I rarely ever get what I want. 
my stepdad then surprised me by grabbing the box out of Entitled Mom's hands and told me, go get in the car. He then followed me out, box in hand. I remember Entitled Mom yelling back at me that she will be talking to the principal about this, but she couldn't do anything since this was after school and not even on school property. When we got home, my stepdad gave me the box and I finally got to open it, and what was inside blew my mind. Inside it was the first four seasons of Supernatural, the first two volumes of The Walking Dead comics, which was perfect because the first season was premiering on Halloween, the complete series of my favorite animated show reboot, Awesome Canadian Show, which I highly recommend you all check out, except The Guardian Code, that's the reboot of Reboot and it's garbage. Harry Potter wand and glasses, a bat webkins, a pair of pumpkin socks, a crap ton of candy, and a Calgary Flames hat signed by the captain himself. I figured that the entitled mom got her husband to get it signed because he works for the Flames. Jealous, dude got to work with Iggy. I was over the moon. I felt like this box was made for me. I mean, monster stories, reboot, and hockey? That's my life in a nutshell, even today. I shared some of the candy with my stepdad to say thank you for helping me. Not sure if he ate it though, probably gave it to my sisters. I was a bit shocked at some of the things in the box because they weren't 100% kid friendly. I mean, a 6 year old could have won that and the Walking Dead comics are graphic as heck. But I guess the entitled mom was so confident that her daughter would win that she didn't care. I mean, I was surprised that my mom let me read the comics at 11. I could read them as long as I didn't show my sisters or take it to school. I guess it was a big forget you to the entitled kid because my mom knew what she did to me at school. But thanks to the entitled mom and entitled kid, I became a Walking Dead and Supernatural fan, which I still am to this day. I never went to a single jelly bean dance again, didn't feel the need to since I had hit the jackpot. I was also scared of the entitled mom and entitled kid. I wrote this story because I was driving to work this morning and I heard fallen leaves on the radio. I remembered this story. And since it's my lucky song, I'm considering going and buying a lottery ticket. Probably won't though. Anyways, thanks for reading. Have an awesome rest of your day. And remember that you are enough. And our final story of the day. How Shy Kid Became More Villainous Than His Bullies Hi Mr. Reddit. I joined the army a while ago and I tried posting this but it got deleted for some reason. So here's attempt number two. This took place many years ago but it's still on my train of thought in my mind. English is my first language and I'm on mobile. Growing up, I was the shy kid from grades one through six. I didn't really have a lot of friends, didn't have a lot of social status, and I just kept to myself. My parents moved around a lot, so I didn't really have much chance on making friends. So because I was pretty much an outcast and kept to myself, I was easy prey for bullies. Whenever I did get bullied by one of the several people that were bullies, I did what any kid would do and went to the teacher. Unfortunately, all the teachers really did was slap them on the wrist and tell them don't do that. But unfortunately, that never got them to stop. All they did was delay them before they were right back at it the next day. From 5th grade to 7th grade, it was a rinse and repeat cycle. I would get bullied, I would tell a teacher, but they wouldn't do anything to stop the bullying. And with so many kids at the time being bullies, there was no way I could truly escape. I remember they would call me names, chase me around, throw rocks at me, take things from my school lunch, and I could never understand why the teachers were just decidedly looking the other way whenever they were doing this. And despite me constantly reporting this, they still wouldn't do anything. I later found out that they would wait till the end of the year to actually punish these kids for what they were doing, just because they didn't want to deal with it all throughout school. But one summer, everything would change. For during this summer, I hit puberty like a wrecking ball. My once smaller than average figure became very large and I started gaining aggressive tendencies and antisocial behaviors because of all the bullying. So when the school year started up again, I noticed that my temper began getting bigger and bigger while my tolerance was getting smaller and smaller. Then one day it happened. While I was minding my own business in math class, the teacher hadn't come in yet so there was a bit of time while we were all getting prepared when one of my more notorious bullies, I'll call Jesse, he's a guy by the way, started out of nowhere slapping me upside the head with his notebook. I knew that this was a direct assault, but I was already seated in class and I didn't really want to get mixed up with anything so I decided to let it go. Then he just kept doing it harder and harder, 
He struck me and also began to encourage other kids to start doing it as well. I had it. I turned around and grabbed my math book and clocked him right in the jaw. Apparently, he was looking for a fight because he barely flinched and he started going at me. He kept throwing wild punches that kept missing. Knowing the teacher would come back any minute, I wanted to end this as soon as possible, so I shoved him as hard as I could in the chest, which apparently was a lot more effort than what I wanted. It knocked him completely off balance and sent him hurtling into the teacher's desk, knocking over all her stuff. And then Jesse began crying. What a baby. The teacher walks in, looking at what happened, and is only taking it at face value, and told me to march to the principal's office. I was told that what I did was unacceptable, despite me trying to defend myself, and I was given an in-school suspension. At this point, I lost all respect for the teachers and the principals, as well as any higher authority school individual in general. I was sick of being the victim and the teachers not doing anything about the bullies, so now I had the power to fight back, literally. I took no crap from any of my former bullies, and I knew it was finally time for several years of payback. But I was smart as well, and I realized that I wouldn't have a leg to stand on if I started anything, so I would let them instigate it. I completely ignored their existence whenever they tried to verbally attack me, but the moment they laid so much as a finger on me, they were going for a ride. One person decided that they wanted to smack me upside the head because I was ignoring them in band class, so I threw a chair at them. One girl decided that she wanted to insult me and stick a spitball in my ear because I told her I didn't care what she thought, so I pulled the stool out from underneath her. She tried to do the same to me, but I'm a fat guy, good luck with that. Another person decided that they wanted to say directly to my face, no one likes you and you're going to die alone. So I stated in return, girl, you're 16 and pregnant, your opinion means nothing to me. It was almost like I insulted her god with the look she gave me afterwards. So it was clear that the bullies hated me, but they knew I would fight back if they provoked me too hard, so they decided to move on to other victims, which I would step in to defend these kids when I could. But soon the problem turned to the teachers, as they didn't like that I was challenging their failed policies. They tried labeling me as a violent student, which, thinking back, they weren't wrong and I was called in every other week as a bogus charge that they tried to expel me for. Example, they tried to expel me because some kid got hit in the face with a ball during PE. They tried this twice and they failed twice. They also tried to punish me by giving me multiple in-school suspensions, but it was clear that it didn't work. But I lost all respect for them and I couldn't give two craps about their policies. My outbursts that I would do went to my head, I admit and I started going by the remaster of heck for all the shows I would put on for the other students in order to pay back my as well as others bullies. Funny enough, every now and again I pass by my old school. Now that I've graduated, I laugh my butt off to see that it was shut down, and I like to think I had something to do with it. Entitled mom demands I fix her car after hours, then gets salty and tries to get me fired when I say no. Obligatory on mobile warning. So, I work as a mechanic at a family-owned buy-here-pay-here dealership in the middle of small-town USA. The pay isn't that great, but since the owner lets us work on our cars after hours, among other nice perks, that more than makes up for it. So it isn't unusual to see one of us still in the shop after we've closed, changing our oil or brakes or whatnot. I was in the shop on a Saturday afternoon. We close at noon on Saturdays doing some routine maintenance on my Camaro, featured in a previous post, and enjoying the nice weather, when I get a visitor. The cast. We've got me, the entitled mom, and the clueless kid. Entitled mom pulls up with steam billowing out from under the hood of her Impala, and I can hear the engine making a loud knocking sound. She gets out and tries the front door. It's locked. However, I had the back garage door open for circulation, and she walked around and got in through the open door. Are you open? I honestly thought she had left. Huh? Oh, good, you're open. My car just started smoking and has been making a weird sound. Can you fix it? Sorry, ma'am. We're closed. I'm just here fixing my car. However, we open at- What? What do you mean you're closed? Oh, no, no, no. You see, I have to get this fixed so Clueless Kid and I can meet my husband. 
Yeah, we're closed and open at 8 on Tuesday morning. Sorry, you'll just have to wait. Surely you can make an exception. I can't drive my car like this. You have to look at it. Clueless Kid gets out of the car and starts knocking on the door asking for Entitled Mom. She opens the garage door and lets him in. No, I don't have to. And you both need to leave because I'm leaving soon and I have to lock up. No, we are not leaving until you look at our car. And who is your manager? The good idea fairy strikes and I smirk. Okay, sure, I'll take a look. Entitled Mom has this smug look on her face, thinking she's won. Boy, was she wrong. I sneakily unlock the door next to the garage door, and I close the garage door as Entitled Mom is walking out with Clueless Kid to keep the cold air in. She doesn't question it. I walk up to her car. It's still running. The steam is turning to smoke. There's smoke coming out of the tailpipe, and the knocking sound is getting worse. I make exaggerated motions and hmm sounds as I look at the dying automobile. Then I turn around. There you go. I looked at it. Entitled Mom, after picking her jaw up from the ground. What? No, that isn't what I meant. Look at it. I casually look over at it again, then look back at her. Okay, I've looked at it. Entitled Mom is turning red in the face. No, that's not what I meant. You didn't even open the hood. I'm playing along as this is pure gold. Okay, sure. I pop open the hood and lift it up when I hear a loud bang come from the engine, and it dies. Yep, she just threw a rod. Well then, you just threw a rod and you're not going anywhere soon. I close the hood and walk back over to her. She just has this completely shocked look on her face. Well, your engine is toast. Gonna need to replace it. Hope you have roadside assistance. I start walking back to go inside when she spins me around by my shoulders and screams. <laughs> What did you do? You broke my car! Now fix it, or buy me another one! Ma'am, this car was done for when you drove it in. I did nothing but what you instructed me to do. Now I'm going home. The diagnosis fee is usually $50, but I'll waive that for now. Come back Tuesday morning. Clueless Kid walks up to Entitled Mom and asks, Mommy, are we meeting Daddy for dinner? Sorry, honey. It seems we won't, because this jerk is being selfish and mean. Clueless Kid breaks down and starts wailing in despair, and then charges at me, trying to knock me down or something. He's only like six, but I wasn't expecting that at all. I quickly ducked in the door I had unlocked and locked it behind me, and he slams face first into the door. As she's doting on him, I close and lock the back garage door and start packing my stuff up to go home all while she's banging on the front door. I grab the back garage door opener and leave, and she chases after me in the parking lot, throwing garbage at my car. I think nothing of it. Out of curiosity, I drive past work the next day, and her car is gone. Less to explain to the boss. Fast forward to Tuesday morning. I show up for work, and who else but Entitled Mom is sitting there waiting for us to open. Joy. Well, she goes on a tirade to my supervisor that I broke her car and left her there. I give my side of the story while she calls me a liar. Then we go to the owner and review the security cam footage, which clearly shows her going around back, her kid attacking me, and her throwing junk at me as I left. To end it all, her demands that I be fired were laughed at, and she was banned from the premises for attempting to assault an employee. And while I was told that I shouldn't have egged her on, they still said my idea was funny as crap and let me go. Next we've got Scary Entitled Customer. Hi Mr. Reddit, I've been on a marathon of your videos recently and the r slash entitled parents are definitely my favorite. I thankfully haven't had too many encounters with entitled parents, but customers, that's a different story. I'm on mobile currently, so I apologize for any formatting errors. For a little background, I am currently 22 and recently graduated from college. I used to work at an amusement park my junior and senior years of college, and boy did I see my fair share of crazy customers. In this story, the cast will be me, yours truly. We have the scary customer, the manager, and the coworker. When I worked for this particular amusement park, they would occasionally have me work selling tickets for what's called overflow. 
Overflow is basically an extension of the main parking lot where people are allowed to park if they're going to a baseball game taking place in the nearby stadium. This job is referred to as a change bagger because you basically hold all your money in a little bag apron which you use to give the customers change. For this job, there are usually two workers and one manager out in the parking lot, just to give you an idea. There was a particular customer, who for this story I'll call Scary Customer, who was quite well known among my coworkers. He was an older man, probably 40s, and had a nasty habit of trying to get workers, especially female workers, fired. For fun, I guess. Basically, he tried to get us to bend rules or would try to confuse us into giving him incorrect change so he could get us fired. It never worked because the managers knew of him as well, but sadly, there really wasn't a way to prevent him from coming to the park as he never got violent. I never had to deal with him for the longest time until one fateful day he drives up and my coworker casually wants me to tread lightly. Hello, sir. Are you here for the game? Yes. How much is parking? It's $25. Now, most people typically gave 30, so it was easy to make change. But not this guy. Oh no, of course not. He shoves several bills at me that appear to total up to almost $90 and hands me a bunch of random change as well. I'm not good at mental math, never have been, and we didn't have a calculator out there, so I was struggling to figure out his change. What's the matter? What's taking so long? I'm sorry, sir. I'm just not good at adding in my head. I continue to try and add everything up. Hurry up! I'm having you all day? I apologize, sir. I'm almost done. I try to pick up the pace, but before I can finish. Look, there's $95 there. Why don't I just give you another five to make it easier? I finish counting a couple seconds later, seeing that it is in fact $95, thinking, hey, maybe he won't try to pull a fast one on me. Boy, was I wrong. Okay, sir, that sounds good to me. I'll get you your change. I take the extra five and give him 75 back. And yes, I made absolutely sure it was the correct amount. This doesn't look like $75. I'm sure I got it right, sir. I double-checked just to make sure. But you just said you're not good at adding in your head. How can I trust that you really gave me $75? Um, well, sir, it's easy for me to add big bills in my head, but I'm not so good with coins. I'm sure, though, that I gave you $75. Now you're just lying. You're trying to steal more money. I want it all back. Now. Well, sir, I can do that. But then you won't be able to park here. Why not? I'm a bit scared now because of the yelling. Well, it's a company policy. If I issue a refund, you can't get your money back and keep the parking ticket. It will be like you haven't paid for the item yet. But I did pay. I just paid for the ticket. Now you're just trying to scam me. Sir. I know that you just paid, but I can't refund you and let you park. Shut up! I know how all you teenage girls are. Try and rob me of my hard-earned money. I was so thrown off by his comment and the fact that I was sure he was about to hurt me that I couldn't think of anything to say. Luckily, I didn't have to as my manager came over after hearing the commotion. What seems to be the problem? This stupid jerk is trying to steal from me, and she refused to let me park here. The manager looks at both of us, dumbfounded. I had never gotten written up at work before, much less been caught doing anything illegal, so for my manager to hear this was highly unusual. I've known Hannah Rose for quite some time, and as far as I know, she's never stolen from customers. Now you're just trying to cover for her. She didn't give me correct change, and now she won't let me park here. She even tried to attack me! I explained my side of the story to manager, about counting up the change, giving him the 75 back, him asking for the refund, etc. At this point, my coworker walks over as well, and she's dealt with this man before. Coworker. Sir, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but she never once raised a hand to you. Now you're all in on it. Whatever happened to decent customer service? Sir. I won't have you harassing us like this, and for the record, Hannah is right. We can't refund you and allow you to park here. It just doesn't work that way. So either you can leave us alone and pull in, or we'll give you the money back and you will have to leave. 
he continues to go on a tirade for another 5 to 10 minutes, all while me and coworker are trying to calm him down and manager now insisting he has to leave without a refund. Manager really didn't take crap from anyone. Finally, he gives up and drives off out of the parking lot, but not before looking straight at me and pointing a finger at me while screaming, I know where you work. I'll be back for you. I was terrified for days afterwards that this guy was going to show up again and hurt me. Thankfully, I never dealt with him again, but I still heard countless horror stories about my other coworkers encountering him and having similar experiences. And our final story of the day, The Church Boy Stalker Saga. This is another story about how my usually spot-on instincts concerning people failed me spectacularly. It starts with an innocent night on the town with my coworker and friend, Georgia. I always call her G. She's a teensy, pocket-sized elf of a girl who bears a close resemblance to a young Claire Danes, so not altogether unfortunate looking. This was during a period when boyfriend and I were separated. She was single too, so we went out to the local watering holes together quite often. It was that period of our lives where a night on the town meant dressing to the nines and then drinking, dancing, and flirting all night long. Now, as for myself, I very rarely drink. I get inebriated even less often. My limit is usually one mixed drink or two beers. I just don't like to put myself into a state where I am not in control, especially in a bar type of setting where you really need to be on your guard. For this reason, I usually drove whenever we went to local watering holes, but that night there was something wrong with my car. If I remember correctly, there was an exhaust leak. It wasn't something that would keep the car from running, but could possibly cause us to be pulled over. Not a scenario that someone who has a drunk passenger and potentially a drink or two in their system wants to invite. Since we didn't want to run the risk of having any run-ins with the law, we decided that Georgia would drive. To make a long story short, Georgia got spectacularly drunk and decided to leave with an ex that she happened to run into during the night. Don't worry though, she says. James said he would take you home. James was the nice looking guy that she had introduced me to during the night. She told me that they went to the same church and she had known him since she was a kid and he was a really nice guy. James and I had been talking and dancing and yes, even flirting a little as the night progressed. Because I felt like we had gotten to know each other a bit and because he came with George's stamp of approval, not something she readily gave to anyone, I felt fairly comfortable accepting a ride home. Also, I was kind of put on the spot since Georgia had already asked James and told me about it in front of him. I didn't want to insult a guy I potentially wanted to go out with. Looking back, I wish to whatever you worship that I had just called a cab. On the way to my place, James dropped a lot of hints. I'm not ready to call it a night. I'd like to hang out a little bit more. I could use another beer, etc. I casually told him that I was tired and ready for bed and thanked him for the ride. He asked for a kiss and I gave him a playful peck on the cheek, patted him on the arm and shut the car door. The next day I go out to run errands and the phone rings as I'm walking in the door. It's James wanting to hang out. I'm tired so I say he can come over and we'll watch a movie and hang out for a short while. When I hang up, I see he's left a couple messages while I was out. Hmm, a little pushy, but okay, I guess. Maybe he just really likes me. We're sitting on the couch watching a movie, and he goes from friendly companion to full-on makeout mode in 0.2 seconds. I mean, one second we're sitting on the couch at a comfortable distance, the next he's practically on top of me, trying to put his tongue down my throat. Oh no, dude, homegirl don't play that. So I'm telling him no, and he's acting like he doesn't get it. He's getting slightly more and more aggressively affectionate, and I'm starting to low-key panic. I don't remember what I said exactly, but I did eventually manage to get him out the door. Relatively unscathed, I thought, save for a copious amount of unwanted slobber. When I went to change for bed later, I found finger marks on my upper arms from where he had gripped me so hard. The next night, I got approximately 10 calls from James. I didn't answer. He left voicemails every single time. This was before everyone had electronic leashes, aka cell phones. I myself only had a landline, so it was a lot easier to ghost someone back then. I figured I'd just not answer the phone and he'd eventually give up. Like most sensible people, right? Wrong. My phone rings at 4am. Now we know nothing good happens at that hour of the night. 
People don't call you up to chat. So when I was jolted out of sleep, I answered the phone automatically without even pausing to think or look at caller ID. It's James. What are you doing? Are you kidding me? I'm sleeping. No, you're not. Yes, I am. <laughs> That's what most people do at 4 a.m. on a work night. Why is your living room light on then? You know that old saying, my blood ran cold? Well, I always thought it was a dramatic phrase to describe sudden fear, but you don't truly understand it until you experience it the way I did. He was calling me from right outside my front door. I was single, lived alone, and had no weapon. I was in the habit of leaving certain lights on at all times because quite honestly, I'm afraid of the dark. I feel safer with lights on and even sleep with a bedside lamp on. I always have since I was a child. I don't remember what I said back except that it involved lots of swearing and it ended with him pounding on my door and calling me repeatedly for about a half hour or so. I eventually had to call the police to get rid of him. The next day, I sarcastically thanked Georgia for the setup and she was furious when she saw the bruises on my arms. She ended up admitting that she didn't really know James all that well, but that they had been acquainted for a long time and he seemed like a nice guy. He kept up the psycho dialing for a while, but finally quit when Georgia confronted him about my bruises and threatened to expose his behavior to their church community, and worse, his mother. Thank goodness. I hope that, since then, James has learned that a ride home does not entitle you to a date or anything else from a girl. Edit. This was over a decade ago, and I live with my boyfriend now. The time for police or other intervention has passed. Yes, I probably should have told the cops, but I sadly did not. At least I'm safe, and I got rid of him. You can't stop stupid too. Booze, brawl, and bullhorns. Hello everyone. It's your large, rotund, two-ton re-army security guard here, D. Fat Man. Back with another set of stories of the entitled variety. As stated before, my previous warnings still apply here, and I'm having someone help me catch all of my mishaps and mistakes, who has added his own comments with these throughout the story. So hopefully this one is a little better than my last two that I will link at the bottom for those who want to read them. I should also warn you that this story does get a little dark at times, so reader's discretion is advised. With that out of the way, a bit of background detail is in order. This two-thirds of this post happened before I was an official security guard. During this time, I was more that odd job kind of guy. The ones that would pick up jobs that are very temporary, that maybe last anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks. In this case, it was the former, ish. The job in question was being a door bouncer for a friend's event and club. The location's normal guy had to leave for a personal reason. At the time, I was helping my friend bring in his equipment for the show as he was playing for a small gig. Like those at nightclubs, just minus the booze, so just about anyone could watch the show. The only rules were that the kids have to be at least 15 and have a parent with him or her mostly because this was still a late night place in the roughest part of town and no outside food or drink, which the latter of the two I understood, being of laws and so forth. The only reason I was asked to do this was they needed a guy big enough to block the door and can handle himself if it gets rough. I was told I would get paid the same as the other guy, but in cash, and I would have free drinks all night, which honestly was a bit of a bonus for me partly because I had little of on-hand cash to enjoy the night with, and trust me, nursing water all night kind of sucks. This way I can still enjoy the music, get my caffeine fix because I totally didn't have a problem, and I get paid for sitting around. Sounds like a triple win to me. So the place opens up and I'm sitting at the door doing my thing, slightly upsetting people who try to come in with drinks. Like seriously? I've been around the bush with all of the drink tricks, like putting a can of beer in a cup with a lid and trying to sneak it in. About two hours roll by, and the music is really jamming and working the door when this father comes up and for this story, I will call him Mr. Bob. Mind you, this is not the same Bob as the first story, as I try to keep away from the stereotypical names like Chads and Karens when using names for these tellings. Personal preference is all. Well, Mr. Bob decided to walk up with his son. I say walk up, but it was more of a wobble up, as it looked like he was already three cases of liquor into a five case night. Something I know won't be allowed, because that's just asking for problems, and the owner had told me that if it looked like they would cause a problem, to not let them in. They had one of those, 
We have the right to turn people away signs on the door that was placed right next to me. Not hard to miss either. He comes up and what I could only guess was a habit, he begins to pull out his wallet. What? What's the door charge? As my guess was right, the guy was sloshed off his rocker and I had already dealt with people like this. For a little bit of context, I'm always the double D for my friends or designated driver, defender, and some of my friends at the time could be very violent drunks, so you learn how to handle people like this. I'm sorry sir, but I can't let you in. What do you mean I can't go in? I have my money right here. He was waving his wallet around like it was Willy Wonka's golden ticket in my face as to rub in the fact that he indeed had a wallet. Frankly, I didn't care and I was getting annoyed. Sir, I don't care. I cannot let you in. Please go home. And why the wonk not? No lie, he literally said wonk. My only guess was that he had a younger kid and instead of teaching them not to say a curse word, they would train themselves to replace those words with something more age appropriate and weird. The only reason I jumped to this one is that a few of my friend's parents would do the same thing with younger brothers and I had been yelled at for using the correct words when I stub a toe and whatnot. About this time, another person comes in and puts his hand on Mr. Bob's shoulder. For the sake of the story, let's call him Jeff. Dad, leave that guy alone. You've already had too much to drink. That's right, Jeff was Mr. Bob's son. At least I knew someone was responsible enough for the family drunk. Now, I'm not saying drinking is bad, but I would always suggest to drink at home or a friend's house and do it responsibly. Partly because that way you know you can crash there and it keeps them and you off the streets where it's safe. No, son, I want in here and this fat wonka is going to let me in. The wonk I am. You're not getting in here till you sober up. Yes, I used his word, partly because I am a smart mouth of the idiot variety. I should have known better to do that, but wisdom comes after being taught a lesson the hard way. Something I wish these entitled parents would learn, but sadly, the world doesn't work that way. Regardless, this seemed to enrage Mr. Bob, and well, I will give him this. He has a mean right hook. I should know. I took it face first, no pun intended. Now, something you should know about me. I hate getting hit in the face. If you want to see the saint turn to Satan fast, then you punch him in the face. Well, that or nail him in the royal twins. So he decided to do the first, and I, being a reactionary kind of person in those days, it came with being that fat kid being picked on. I had been beaten up quite a few times when in school, and it didn't take long for me to learn how to protect myself. So without thinking, I slammed my head into Mr. Bob's face. Lucky for me, I have a rather hard head, because Mr. Bob dropped like a rock. Jeff apologized for his father and dragged him off and I went back to my seat at the door. It seems because of this, the people that had been waiting for me to let them in kind of dispersed. I don't know if it was because of the drunk or that I had no qualms about taking names. Shortly after this, the owner came out to hand me a refill on my drink that I had asked not too long before this. He had noticed the blood that was starting to drip from my nose. Here's your, oh geez, what happened to your face? A drunk tried to come in and he learned the first rule when it comes to me the hard way. First rule? You don't mess with the fat man. Now you may wonder where the entitled person comes in on this story. Don't worry, I'm getting to it. Well, outside of the drunk one. The next day rolls around and through my friend who I had helped set up for his show, the club owner wanted to see if I could cover another night for the same pay and all. I said sure, as I needed the cash at the time and I asked what time I needed to show up. After the details were ironed out, I took my spot outside the door when this lady came up with Jeff from the previous night. For the story, let's call the lady Miss Virago because I like it better than calling her a Karen. Anyone who doesn't know, Virago is a domineering, violent, or bad-tempered woman. Even though this lady looked like she was trying to pull off that discount store Jersey Shore look and not in the right way. Are you the guy that beat up my husband last night? It depends. Was he drunk and thought he could get his way? No, it was the well-mannered gentleman that was only asking about the entrance fee before you assaulted him. I gave her a look of, you can't seriously be that stupid, can you? Before I answer, Jeff spoke up. Mom, I told you that isn't what- Before he could even finish, Miss Virago turned around and gave that, Shut up! pointed finger to her son. 
He will not interrupt me when I am talking to the fat waste of space. I couldn't help but look surprised at this lady. Seriously, this lady not only gave her son that how dare you attitude, but to insult me within the same few moments. Now, Tubbo, answer my question. She demanded, and personally, I was having none of this. Lady, I don't care what kind of high horse you think you rode up on, but what happened last night is between your husband and I. He should count himself lucky I didn't call the cops on him for assault. Your son can attest to that, and if I were you, I would leave now. How dare you speak to me that way? You should respect your elders. Respect is earned, lady. I will admit, I let my temper get the better of me, as I said, lady, with a lot of venom in my voice. Right about then, the owner of the club stepped out to see what was going on. What's going on out here? Before I can even answer. Are you his manager? I'm the owner. Why? I want this fat waste of space fired for insulting me and attacking my husband last night. The owner just blinked for a few moments like he was trying to process what was just asked of him. If it's who I think it is, then do you mean the assault your husband did to him and that I have the footage of? Yes, that one. Look, I'm sorry for my mom. Was all he got out before his mother decided to interrupt again. You will not apologize to them. All I'm thinking at this point is, seriously lady? Bow out while you still can, because there is no way you can win. Now I expect you to do your job. Fire this fat piece of human waste and make it up to my husband. I won't be doing that. Both you and your husband are banned from my club, and I want you to leave before I call the cops and have you removed. Excuse me? You can't do that. Watch me. He went back in to make a call. And the only reason I know this was that the cops showed up not too long after. The whole time leading up to this, Miss Virago was trying to get into the building and I just sat in her way. Because when a fat man decides to be a barricade, he can do a real good job of it. After a bit, I heard the knock at the door behind me and I stepped out of the way. All to watch the cop step out from inside the club. The owner told me later he had the cop come up from the back. And from what I found out, the cop was someone the owner knew from before he joined the force. So the owner showed the officer the footage from the night before and now. Sadly, this Miss Virago didn't get arrested, but was removed from the grounds. After that, Jeff apologized for his parents and walked off after the officer and Miss Virago. And since I like telling these stories in threes, here's the last one for this post. This one takes place a lot closer to home for me namely my front yard, and this was quite some years ago. I lived about one street down from a school and still do, so I see a lot of the students walking to and from it. This day, it was a fairly nice day to sit outside. Normally, I would have been sitting on my computer, but I was having it render stuff and I figured I would just leave it alone and get some fresh air. So I grabbed my Kindle and sat on my porch to read. I was partway through one of my favorite books, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Not an important point, but regardless. While I read, I had my Kindle play music as it helps me either relax or get in the mood for the scene. In this case, I was listening to my own music, which I will link at the bottom for those that want to listen to it. Regardless, it was about that time for students to get out and I see a few of them walk down the street. Nothing special happens until this one kid decides to play with my dad's tulips. Now, as I had alluded to in my last post, some of the kids in the area were not the nicest of kids. Egging my car wasn't the worst of it, but I don't think you want to hear about those times. Well, lately some of the kids had taken to picking my dad's flowers and I asked the kid not to touch the flowers. The kid jumped and saw me before running off. Nothing new because I've been known to disappear and reappear on people when they least expect it. So I think nothing of it and throughout the time I said out front I told a few others. Now you may be wondering, why did I make it a point to point out the first kid if a few others did the same thing? That's easy, my dear readers, because he returned later with his mother, who for this I will call Mrs. Harridan. Like before, Google it. Editor here, shall I keep filling these in with the meanings or no? Miss Harridan is the main antagonist of the 2003 comedy film Daddy Daycare. Between the time the kid ran off and reappeared with his mother, my dad had come out and given me a bullhorn that a friend of his was coming by to pick up. She came marching up to me like a woman on a warpath. Are you the boy that yelled at my son? No, 
I'm the guy who asked him to leave the flowers alone. How dare you tell my son he can't look at your flowers? I didn't say he couldn't look. I just didn't want him to touch them. And why not? They are only flowers. You can go to any field and pick one. Then he can go to any field other than my yard to pick one. And what if my son wants the ones here? Then he can take a picture of it and go find another one that looks just like it. You're going to let my son pick the flowers here? No. Excuse me? She sounded offended by that and I couldn't help myself. You must be hard of hearing. Here, let me help you. I picked up the megaphone next to me and said through it to her face. I said no. Now get out of my yard. Miss Harridan began to get red in the face and tried to grab the megaphone from my hands, which I just pulled it away out of her reach. Now I suggest you leave. And why should I? I smirked like the devil and pulled the bullhorn up to my mouth. Ma'am, I don't care how much you want my fat body. I will not sleep with you. I know, I'm a jerk, but it was so worth it as the woman turned bright red, giving me the death glare. Still smirking like the devil, I acted like I was about to say something much, much worse. She got the message and stomped off with her son in tow, and I went back to my book. So it goes to show you, if you really want to throw off one of these entitled parents, you've got to turn it on them in a way they can't defend. I figured that this time I would share these stories that I've only told my neighbors and my family with everyone here since I saw those in the comments of Mr. Reddit's video over my last post. I will admit, you all lifted my spirits that day as I was having a bit of a rough day. So thank you everyone, I do appreciate it. I have quite a few more of these stories as well as some of my favorite stories of my own stupidity that I may share. Just the latter, I'm going to have to figure out what kind of tag they are going to need. Any thoughts everyone? And to Mr. Reddit, thank you for another wonderful reading of my last post, and I hope you enjoy this story as well. I tried my best to omit the bad words in this one again for you. Editor's note. With how much he swears in Discord, and when we game, I can attest, he held back on the curse words quite some bit. To everyone else, don't forget to sub and click those notification bells for Mr. Reddit's videos, so you can prevent those entitled Karens out there from getting what they want. While I may be one large fat obstruction, I can only hold them off for so long. Because you can't stop stupid, but you can hold it off for a little while longer. And for those Karens out there, this is one fat re-army security guard who has got your numbers and has no problem standing up to you. So come have a go if you think you're hard enough. Thank you for reading. Hope you enjoyed. Karen, I don't care if your five-year-old plays Mario Kart. He can't drive my mom's minivan. Hello, Mr. Reddit. Hope you're having a Karenless day if this is on YouTube. Thanks. Okay, now let's begin. Background. I was going to Home Depot. We needed a new carpet. With my dad and little brother after church because it was Sunday. I'm one of those people who don't care what you wear to church. So, my dad and little brother go into Home Depot and I stay in the car because me and my dad don't get along well. It's not a bad relationship. It's just we argue a lot and an angsty teen mixed with an adult man don't go along well, especially when we have the same personality according to my mom. So I'm in my mom's minivan, my dad's was blocked by my older sisters, when I hear a small child say, Mommy, look at that car. And so it begins now. It's time to get ready to Karen. Our cast, we've got me. We've got Karen, crazy entitled lady who deserves your house, the entitled kid, the bratty five-year-old who thinks because he was in one of those car carts means he knows how to drive. And S, the angel sent down by God to help smite all Karens. It's nice, isn't it? Can I drive it, mommy? I'm in the passenger seat, just like, yeah, right. No way this lady is letting her kid in to drive a car that isn't hers. But she goes to the driver's side and reaches for the handle. So me, being the quick-witted 15-year-old, quickly hit the lock all doors button on the passenger side, I don't know what it's actually called, and it locked all the doors. All this did was make Karen mad. She looked up and saw me, because somehow she didn't see me, and said, You there, boy, let me in now. Yeah, I'm gonna have to say no to that. Mommy, I want to drive. You will soon. She then looks at me and says the dumbest thing I have ever heard. You better let me in now. 
or else I will call the police for my stolen car. At that point, I was done. Yeah, still no. One, it's not your property. Two, I don't know you. And three, I'm not letting that kid drive because there's no way he knows how to drive at like five years old. Oh, it's fine. He plays Mario Kart. He'll be fine. Okay, scratch what I said earlier. That is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. So dumb, in fact, I'm pretty sure it gave me an aneurysm out of sheer stupidity. Someone must have seen what was going on because a security guard came over. Ma'am, what's going on here? Karen, with a smirk on her face. Oh, hello, sir. My oldest son, Trevor, locked me out and won't let me in. What? Lady, I don't even know you. Trevor, stop yelling. My name isn't Trevor. Young man, can you prove this? Oh, heck yeah, I can. I pull out my wallet and show him my high school student ID. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to stay while I call the police. Karen realizes she messed up and books it, but the security guard just walked out and came back. Did you let them get away? Yeah. Why? Because I got a picture of her license plate. I was so happy with this guy's clever move, and when my dad came out with my little brother, we told him the whole story. So I got free Tim Hortons. Yay, Canada. Oh, and we will be pressing charges because that lady is insane. And if you want to hear about it, I will update it. Next up, we've got Entitled Mothers at the Zoo. This happened several months ago, but I have a very good memory, so I remember it very well. There will be two stories in this post, although they're both kind of short. For background, my boyfriend and I went to the zoo with his older sister on the free day. The zoo was crowded and it was insanely hot considering that it was in the middle of winter. Anyway, I digress. As we are walking along, we passed the sea lion enclosure which had a large open top so that people could get close to the sea lions who were currently sunning themselves and playing with a large ball. We stopped for a moment to watch and I look over to the side because I see something moving close to the railing. There is a mother with a child who is no more than two years old who is holding this child up over the railing with his legs hanging over the inside of the enclosure. I was shocked, of course, but the situation was quickly handled by a security guard who was reprimanding the mother. I didn't catch all of what was said because it was quite loud and we had started to move away already, but I did catch her saying that she had a right to hold her child and that he was too small to see what was going on and wanted to play with the sea lions. Later on in the day, we decided to stop and take a few photos in a little photo booth. It was really cramped as both my boyfriend and his sister are tall and muscular. So we all squeeze inside this little photo booth and start taking our pictures. That's when I see little hands sneaking through the curtains and trying to enter the booth. I ignored it until I feel those same little hands grabbing at my boots and pulling them. This was rather disruptive and rude, but I continued to ignore it. And then two tiny little faces popped through the curtain. My boyfriend looks at the kids and asks them what they are doing. We want to take pictures. It's our turn now. You've been in here forever. I roll my eyes because this is just little children being dramatic and rude. My boyfriend shoos the children away and we finish taking our pictures and manage to unfold ourselves from the booth. As we wait for the photos to come out, we see the little children again. They're hovering next to the little slot where the pictures come out and giggling to themselves. We ignored them again and just waited for the pictures. As soon as they came out, the kids grabbed them and tried to bolt, but my boyfriend just grabbed them by the collars and took the photos from them. They started crying and screaming and kicking at both me and my boyfriend. His sister stayed out of the way, smart woman. We locate the mother of these two little banshees standing several feet away and looking at her phone. She seemed completely disinterested in what her children were doing and not even aware of where they were. My boyfriend scoops up the two wailing banshees and drops them in front of their mother. She starts immediately screaming at my boyfriend. How dare you touch my children? Your children have been harassing me and my family and stole our photos. They're just playing. And besides, it's only some photos. It's not like it's anything important. You can just take a selfie. My boyfriend is an amazingly patient person and he really doesn't enjoy arguing with stupid people. So he simply tells her to watch her kids and then walks away. We leave and enjoy the rest of our day. I know this wasn't crazy or super intense, but I hope you enjoyed it. And our final story of the day. 
Entitled coworker bullies and embarrasses me and other coworkers. Gets knocked down a peg by administration. Hi, Mr. Reddit. I enjoy your videos and decided that my first ever Reddit post should be on your subreddit. I apologize for formatting if it's incorrect. If there are any changes that need to be made, please let me know in the comments. English is my native language, so I will do my best with grammar and spelling. This story is long, sorry, but I am a stickler for details. This just happened so it's fresh in my brain and is something that has been coming to a head for months. Backstory I'm a librarian in teen services in a public library. The community we cater to is fairly big, housing one of the largest school districts in this portion of the state. Many patrons visit in the course of the day, making us very busy, especially as it gets closer to the summer. I started here a little over two years ago. This community, however, is pretty affluent and has families who are well off. It's not an uncommon occurrence to have entitled people during the day, but everyone does their best to maintain a professional demeanor. Everyone except my coworker. For this story, he will be dubbed Gary. Gary has a history of also being entitled and is the only person in the department who thinks he is the best example of a librarian to ever live. He has worked in the building for almost 12 years, the longest out of anyone in teen services, but he is still only a part-time librarian like I am. Gary won't hesitate to talk down to anyone he feels is below him, which is almost everyone, and will put on his best butt kisser face to anyone in authority over him and play favorites with patrons and make it extremely obvious. He will listen to someone talk and throw them under the bus so hard at the first opportunity that person wouldn't have time to feel it. The Perfect Two-Face I try to avoid Gary as much as I possibly can and keep exchanges with him short, sweet, and to the point. I don't go into detail about anything in my personal life with him or talk about someone in the workplace. I know his game. But these last two instances, after many prior, Gary had gone much too far and finally got caught in the act by the one person with the most power in the entire library. Our cast. We've got me. We've got Gary, the obnoxious and self-important coworker. And then we've got coworkers one and two also librarians, but full-time and have authority over me and Gary, along with the library director. Story Friday nights at the library are the busiest of the week. In this one program, we can have an upwards of 65 teens in one room with three librarians and a security guard to wrangle them. One runs the main program, and the others try to maintain as much order as possible. This time, I am the librarian in charge of the night. It's the anime club's event, and I am the librarian who coordinates the club. I am running a Kahoot, trivia challenge that allows the winners to win prizes. They get very competitive during games, so there is the normal trash talking, yelling when they get an answer right or wrong, as well as the normal chatter of a room full of 50 plus teenagers. After one very intense round, a winner is declared, which causes a bunch of cheers, jeers, and laughter from the group. I'm honestly having a great time with them, and they're really into it. Unfortunately, the good couldn't last long. Into the room storms Gary, looking as pompous and self-important as always. From across the room and over the heads of everyone I'm running this program for, he yells at me. OP, it's too loud in here. You should know better. I'm closing the doors here since I have people studying in the next room. Really? You're running the program. Control them better. Gary, it's a Friday night program. They're allowed to have fun. Where's coworker one? I don't know saw her walk out of the room for something. I ignore him after that and continue the games, feeling my face get red from embarrassment from being yelled at in front of everyone and being yelled at in general. I hate confrontation and knew I was going to be in a bad mood for the rest of the night. The teens at least cheered me up by turning the rest of the trivia and movie watching into a game where if someone is too loud then someone else will act like Gary and yell at them. It did manage to at least make me smile again. That same night, fast forward an hour. My main part is done, and everyone's watching an anime movie I pulled for the night. Princess Mononoke, if anyone wanted to know. Now, I'm assisting the other co-workers with the rest of the room when two boys we know come in. It's almost past admittance time, and co-worker one was telling them as such when Gary comes literally running into the room, yelling, Nope, nope, absolutely not, pointing at the two boys. These two have been trouble for me in the other room this entire night. They cannot be allowed to come into the room tonight. I am standing there in shock, trying not to nervous smile and or laugh at the outrageous reaction I just saw. Coworker 1 is looking just as flabbergasted 
but composes herself first. Also a non-confrontational person, she talks to the boys and tells them that she has to take Mr. Gary's word since we weren't there earlier. The boys look sad and said that they wanted to join in the program so they wouldn't get in trouble elsewhere in the building. We didn't want to turn them away, but felt like we were forced to, with Gary hovering over us like a hawk. The end of that night, I spoke to coworker one about the incident I had with Gary before the one we both experienced. She said she would tell the department head about it. As a result, everyone who worked on a Friday night were told to come in for a meeting where common courtesy was spoken about and that everyone was told to respect each other and not to interfere with a librarian helping a patron, running a program, or doing a one-on-one -on -one appointment for special technologies unless it's an emergency. If you feel a librarian is conducting a program not to the best of their abilities, you talk to them privately and do not humiliate them on the public floor. Everyone at this meeting knew Gary was the person being quietly called out here, but it wasn't until later that I realized it was all for naught. Another Friday night rolls around. I'm scheduled outside of the program room and Gary is the person running the program. Before my dinner break, he corners me in the department office. OP, tonight you're in the fiction room. You stay there tonight since it's not your program to run. Tonight is my night and I don't want your usual interfering. It takes a second of me staring at this man in disbelief before I can control the rising anger and keep my cool. All right, Gary. Though, if it's an emergency, I will go to coworker one or coworker two tonight. Don't worry, I won't come to you at all. Good. It seems that meeting did do its job. He looks all smug and swaggers out of the office. Before I leave, coworker two comes in and asks if I was all right. She saw me with Gary and knew by the look on my face as he was talking that he had said something I didn't like. This woman is my work mom. Gary told me, between the lines, that the meeting we had for Friday Night Librarians was for me. Her face was priceless. She responds, He told me the other day that he didn't know why he had to go to that meeting since it clearly wasn't meant for either him or me. Seriously, this guy doesn't get it. I just roll my eyes and tell her that I'll see her after my dinner break. Turns out this dinner break is my saving grace. As I am heating my food in the staff kitchen, in walks the library director. Hi, OP. Long time no see. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, library director. Are you working tonight? Yes. It's the board of trustees meeting at 8.30 till 10. So I need to stick around. The light bulb lights up in my brain. Tonight is karaoke night for the Friday teen program. Why don't you come down and take a peek? Some are pretty good and others make a parody of it and it's honestly hilarious. Library director says she will come down later to me and we can go watch an act or two together. I agree and continue with my dinner. The moment of truth. Halfway through the program, library director comes down, greets everyone in the room I'm in before allowing me to leave my post to escort her to the program. I open the door first for her and enter quietly, not wanting to throw off the teen singing. Not even halfway into the room, Gary immediately homes in on me like a heat-seeking missile and does what he does best and goes off the rails in marvelous fashion. What are you doing in here? I told you to stay in that other room. You don't belong in here and should know better than to come in during a performance. What is wrong with you? I didn't even flinch right now since I was expecting it and the voice behind me put a sickly sweet smile on my face. Library director says, Gary, I think we should talk out here for a few minutes. OP, feel free to go inside and listen. I will be right there. The look on Gary's face is miserable as he realized who spoke to him. I slide into the room and quickly mutter to coworker two what happened and we give each other a small high five. Gary is still working at the library, but he does have a write up on his file for disrespecting fellow professionals after speaking to the head of department who also couldn't do so much since this whole time were intimidated by Gary and his antics. He still works at the library and has apologized to me in person. I took it with a grain of salt, but I am civil with him to where we can talk about the work shift without the tension eating up in the room. He's not cured, but he is more bearable because his job could literally be on the line. Finally, I have had patron encounters and programs without him butting his nose into my business like a normal librarian. Entitled Mom and Entitled Kid Ruin My 3-Day Vacation Hi Mr. Reddit and fellow Re-Army. So many of these Karen stories are very entertaining, so I decided to share my story here, and it's a long one. And of course, on mobile, 
English is my first language. Formatting, blah, blah, blah. Background. In July 2018, I was invited to go on a trip to a campground for three days as a reward for babysitting my nine-year-old neighbor when his parents needed me. I was not the only one invited to go though. Enter the entitled family. The cast, we've got me, the 14-year-old victim of Karen. Nice kid, my nine-year-old neighbor. Nice mom, my neighbor, nine-year-old's mom. And entitled mom, the Karen. Entitled kid, the Brad. So my story begins on a Friday last July when we waited for entitled mom and entitled kid to show up at nice mom's house to get this trip started. Entitled mom wanted to drive her car for the trip. Surprised? Nope. Anyway, she had picked us up at 7.30 p.m. Nice start on the trip. So by the time we got to campground, it was almost 9 p.m. We unload the car and this happens. Oh my gosh. Cleaning up words here, Mr. Reddit. I have to drive back home because my mom can't watch the dog and I have to drop him off at my sister's house. What? We just got here. I know, but there is no one else. Can I leave Entitled Kid here with you overnight? Because I don't feel like driving back here. Well, okay. What time are you coming back tomorrow? Oh, I'll be back by 8 a.m. So Entitled Mom gets back in car and takes off. After about an hour, we get settled into our cabin for the night because it was too late to do anything else. We had our video games as entertainment that night, so it wasn't a total loss. But eventually, me and Nice Kid were getting tired and wanted to sleep. But no, this was not going to happen. Entitled Kid bounced all over us all night and whined that he wanted his mom. Nice mom called her and she said to hand over the phone so Entitled Kid could watch a movie. He kept whining until 4 a.m. This is just the beginning. We get up at 11 to see the Entitled Mom hasn't come back. Nice mom had tried to call her, but calls went ignored. So we decided that we wanted to go to the pool. Yes, this place had fun things to do. It had a lake with a beach, concession stands with snacks, pool, game room, and playground. Entitled Kid got up miserable and whined because he didn't want to swim. Oh joy. So I took Nice Kid to the pool with me while Nice Mom went to the game room with Entitled Kid. Hours passed and Entitled Mom finally shows back up. It was 3.30 p.m. Here is the next conversation between Entitled Mom and Nice Mom. I have been trying to call you all day. Well, I took the dog to my sister's house and decided to take a swim in her pool and have lunch with her. I had to entertain Entitled Kid because he didn't want to go swimming. Well, he's happy, right? Then it doesn't matter. As I was listening to all of this, my mental facepalm happened. So far, this Entitled Mom has really made this trip miserable. But this was not the worst. Oh no. Remember that I mentioned the concession stands? Well, we all headed over there for some grub. I was looking at all of the goodies when I got that tap on my shoulder. Entitled Mom told me that I had to buy her and Entitled Kids food with my spending money because she forgot her cash. I was like, what the heck in my head? Who asks a teenager for money? Will this nightmare end? Unfortunately not. Entitled Mom pulled one more stunt, the one that just made me mentally explode. There was a beach party that night for all the kids and teens. We were excited for some fun. It was starting at 7 p.m. Entitled Mom says that it takes place during Entitled Kid's bedtime, 8 p.m., and that since she is not going, then nobody can go. Me, Nice Kid, and Nice Mom looked at her like she was crazy. Nice Mom had really had it and basically told her that we were going and she could keep her kid inside. For once, the Entitled Mom couldn't get the words out because we just walked away. She did follow because we could hear Entitled Kid whining about it. We did have fun that night and we were glad when she left the next morning. The nice mom decided we could stay an extra day because of all the drama. We had fun without them. Thanks for reading. Next up we've got McDonald's wrongly terminates me. I get revenge. Context. Jerk general manager will be called Caddy. My shift of workers will be called my shift. Owners will be called owners. Me will be called me. Felon manager will be called Darren. 
Lawyer will be called Lawyer. For a little backstory, I used to work for a McDonald's in my hometown in Arkansas, not giving the town name. I worked my way up from crew to crew trainer to management over the course of four and a half years and one store transfer. I'm now working as a manager in store two when Katy comes up to me and asks if I want to start working overnight with a $1 raise. So I say heck yeah, more money and a consistent schedule, win-win in my book. So my next shift rolls around and I come in and meet my shift of workers, pretty cool people. Well, about four weeks go by and I find that the shift right before mine isn't stocking up their station before they leave and leaving my shift with nothing and we are left scrambling to get things in order as well as restock for morning shift, aka Caddy's shift. Well, I stay late one day and talk with Caddy about evening shift not restocking for my shift and she says it's my shift's job to only stock for my shift, nothing else. So I say okay and go home. Well, that night rolls around and cue revenge. I tell my shift what Caddy says and they are more than happy to not only do their jobs, but not have to roll Caddy's 12 cases of burritos. Each case is 80 single burritos for her morning shift. Well, that morning comes and Caddy is fuming as she comes in me and my shift clock out and go home. As I'm pulling into my driveway, I receive a call. It's Caddy yelling at me, saying I'm written up for not preparing for her shift and had to come back and personally hand roll her 12 cases of burritos. I then say, but you said it's the shift on duty's job to prep and stock for said shift. She said, I don't care, get in here and do it or don't come back. I reluctantly go in and roll them sign my write-up, and then head over to the main office to chat with the bosses who suggest a list for the evening shift, so they will remember to restock before they leave. Things then get a little better for about a month and a half when we lose three managers and seven employees, so Caddy decides to promote three of the worst possible employees to management, one being a felon who is charged with theft. Well, Darren is put on evening shift, and stuff starts to go missing. First it was small, now it's things like giant 5 pound packs of M&Ms, a box of patties and so on. Well, I start to keep a journal of all the stuff that goes missing and most but not all is on Darren's shift. So I let Caddy know that she needs to look at his shift to see where all the products are going. She then tells me not to worry about other people's shifts and only worry about mine. So I say okay and drop the subject and go back to my shift. Well, about two more weeks pass and I start to notice the safe where we keep our money from our store starts to become messed up. So I, as the overnight manager, have to count it so I can close for the next day. It should come around to about $1,500. If not, I'm supposed to call Caddy so she can come in and fix it. Well, I count it and I'm short $600. So I'm freaking out and call Caddy. She groggily answers the phone saying she will be in in about 15 minutes, so I go over and tell her Darren was on shift last night, which is stated in our handbook on what we are supposed to do. Well, she gets there and she is furious at me because I must have stolen the money because I'm the only manager there. I then state, no, I was the manager that came in. It was Darren who was here first. She says whatever and adjusts the system so I could close it out while she left. Well, the next day rolls around and I get called asking if I could stop by work for a minute to talk to Caddy about last night, so I say okay. I get there and she comes out with termination and theft papers saying I must sign them as I was being terminated for theft of $600. I signed the termination, not the theft papers. I was in shock. I worked for over four and a half years for this place and I'm being fired for something I didn't even do? This won't stand, I said to myself. Time for revenge. Well, I leave and contact a lawyer about this and hand them my journal I've been keeping track of the theft in. And a week later, we go to the McDonald's headquarters to speak with the owners. Well, to our surprise and luck, Caddy is there, giving information on me to the owners. I smile and wave as I walk up with my lawyer and she just stares at me with daggers. As my lawyer speaks to the owners, 
He hands them the journal and says, my client has a record of when this theft had started up until his wrongful termination. He then states, if this can't be resolved here, we will see you in court. Then I see Caddy go pale and sit down as the owners look through my journal and then ask her why she didn't do anything to Darren or at least look into it and the other shifts that I had reported. They then turn to me and say I can have my job back and anything on me is thereby rescinded as of that moment. I politely decline as I just wanted my name to be cleared and the changes be dropped. They then turn to Caddy and say go back to your store. We will be by shortly to chat with you about this matter. But little did they know I had a plan in store for their restaurant. As I left, I waited for Caddy to go back to her restaurant. I see her leave and start to head back to the restaurant as well. Not to see her get chewed out but for a far more risky plan I had in store. I got over there and waited 10 minutes. Then I went around to the back of the store, making sure to stay in the camera's blind spot until I came to an outside box in the bushes behind the building with one big black switch inside it. I switch it, power goes off, and I get the heck out of Dodge and park at the phone store across the street. As I park, I see mass pandemonium coming from the McDonald's employees, they're rushing out of the restaurant, followed by Caddy who is raging mad and is screeching like a banshee at the employees who ran outside. All the while, the owners who just pulled up witnessed the whole ordeal. I'm now moved on in life, but man did that feel good to get one up on my jerk boss. And Mr. Reddit, if you use this in your next video, you have my permission. Edit. Thanks for the silver. Next up we've got, move your car. Note, not gonna bother giving names. If you lack the reading comprehension to keep up, then too bad. So I live in an old southern town with a perpetually crowded central square, made more crowded because it is the county seat and the county seat complex is across the street on one side, along with all of the city and county government buildings stretching for a few blocks in that direction. So one day off, I run errands and hit up the best local taco shop. This place has no AC outside of the kitchen and the inside is always in the upper 80s or hotter on a winter day. And the signage outside even points out you come for the food and not the parking. The parking being nearly non-existent, I drive to the square to park and eat between errands. After five or more laps on the one-way streets around the square, I look out and see someone pulling out of one of the angled inside spots. These spots are all at an angle so you can quickly pull into one and quickly back out. That will be important later. Given that a heat wave had just started, I deign to eat in my car with the air running. I pretty much inhale the first taco, bliss, fine cut beef, cilantro, etc. That's when I hear the horns. Some dingbat is behind me flashing her lights clearly thinking I'm about to pull out, and that's when it hits me through my food bliss. I'm nearly at a 90 degree angle to the road. It's about then she gets out of her car and starts screaming like a stuck pig. Give me my spot, you! Well, yeah. I served in the army where you learn to say a lot of bad words, but she was really overdoing it with them. Amused, I took a sip of whatever kind of coke I was drinking, Dr. Pepper I believe, and pulled out another taco. The horns were getting far louder and multiplying. The lunch rush of both city and government workers was hitting and traffic sucks here. And she's brought it to a standstill. At this point, she waddles up beside the driver's door and starts shrieking. Move, I need to get my child ice cream. The ice cream shop on the square was good, but not that good, still pretty good. Finishing a taco, I take another sip of Coke and crack my window. Lady. You're directly behind me. I can't move. Neither can two lanes of traffic. Just to be clear, yes, she was pulled across not one, but two lanes of lunch hour traffic, pulled directly behind a parked car and yelling at the driver to move. This is where she loses it, is what most stories here seem to say. But let's be honest, this started with her losing it. Move your darn car. I want ice cream and need to park. Nice flex, lady. Forget your kid that fast. I roll my window back up. She then starts shrieking. Move, I need to park. Move, I need to park. Move, I need to park. By this point, she's attracted a lot of attention. I can see a kid in her car's front passenger seat quietly reading a book. 
no doubt used to mommy's temperament, paying the events no mind. She also has at this point attracted the attention of a group of teens, school having just ended, and they pick up her chant, sort of. Her chant is timed like clockwork. Move! I need to park! Move! I need to park! After a minute of this, the teens join in. Whenever she says move, they start to say, like a cow. So unfair to cows. It's a few more repetitions till she realizes they're mocking her, not agreeing with her, and she charges them like they're an all-you-can-eat buffet. But she only makes it a few steps before reality once again disappoints her, as by this point, multiple county sheriff deputies and the city cops have flooded out of the courthouse across the street to see what in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here. They say something in a loud command voice that I can't make out and her charge stops. Officers, do your job and make him move. I need to park. Ma'am, get back in your vehicle and quit blocking traffic. The traffic can wait for me to park. He needs to move now. This is where I start to lose it and start to laugh pretty hard and set my food container into the passenger seat. The cops don't really do or say much. Frankly, I suspect they were too dumbfounded and she turns back to my car. Move your car, you jerk! I need to park! Ma'am, get back in your car and follow the patrol car in front of you to a safe parking spot. Now. I need ice cream! My child needs ice cream! Well, she didn't get ice cream. About then, I see movement in the rear view, and a female officer gets into her car and starts moving it, moving it down the road out of sight. The poor kid is still reading. At this point, she loses it, screeches, and charges towards her car. Yes, cops were in her way. Yes, they all went down like bowling pins. Thankfully, the cars in front of the blockage hadn't started moving, or someone may have been hurt. Fed up with her crap, a cop tased her, landing the prongs in the small of her back, and four six foot six or larger sheriff's deputies proceed to attempt to gently move her over to a park bench, adroitly catching her before she could even fall over. They succeed, and the bench doesn't break, somehow. One of the officers turns towards my car, and I lower my window fully. Sir, are you okay? He seemed a tad confused, a fair reaction. I ponder for a minute and respond honestly. Seem to be. Sir, am I just tripping and drooling on myself, or did that actually happen? And the cop proceeds to lose it, half falling, half leaning onto my car laughing. After picking himself up and trying to dust pollen off of himself, he then tells me, Honestly, I'm not sure about myself either right now. Have a wonderful day. You too, officer. I think I'll get some ice cream. That would be the perfect ending, but this whale wasn't done yet. Hearing that, she then made some loud noise. She had been zip-tied to the bench. I guess she was too fat for handcuffs and lunges in my direction. All she manages to do is fall flat on her face as she tips the whole bench over. In case anyone cares, waffle cone, two scoops of pistachio. Entitled kid and entitled mom want my laptop cover. Get angry when I say no. Backstory. I'm currently at university on the Gold Coast, Australia. I won't name the university I attend, you know, privacy. But let's just say you can get a tram there. A little fact about me is that I love Japanese culture and I love anime. And no, I'm not a weeaboo. Now at the time, I was given a protective cover for my laptop. It's pretty cool. It's black and has two fiery fists, one with blue flames and the other orange. I even put stickers on cover that my little sister gave me. Two logo stickers from an art shop, Lemon Grab from Adventure Time, a Jumping Jolteon, a Fumikaji Tokiyami, and two versions of All Might from Hero Academia. I was sitting on the tram with my laptop out. I finished a lecture that day and was heading home, and I decided to do some work before I got home. The tram arrived at the next station, and enter Entitled Mom. Big lady, maybe in her early 40s, and Entitled Kid, maybe around 5 or 6. They took a seat across from me. I paid no mind to them and got back to work. Three minutes later, I hear an, Excuse me? I look up and see Entitled Kid was looking at me. Is that a Jolteon sticker? Yes, it is. Do you like Pokemon? Entitled Kid gets excited. Yes, yes, I do. Jolteon is one of my favorite Pokemon. I smiled and I let him take a better look. 
He looked in awe at my cover and says he likes all my stickers and my cover. Then he says those fateful words. Cool. Can I have them? I chuckle. Sorry, kid. My sister gave them to me, and I like them too. Ah, please, please, please. Sorry, bro. Entitled Kid then sat back with his mother and angrily glared at me, then tells his mom that I wouldn't give him my stickers, and she stomps over to me. Why won't you give my child your stickers? Because my sister gave them to me, and even if I want to give your kid one of my stickers, it will rip off and the laptop cover was pretty expensive. You're too old for cartoons. Just give them to me. I'm already done with this lady's crap. So what? You can't tell me what I like. I kindly tell her to leave me alone and mind her own business. She goes back to her entitled kid and then whispers to him, and he had a huge grin on his face. I reached the last station and put away my laptop in my bag and headed out. There's one exit at the last station where they do ticket checks and security is tight. If you're not traveling with a valid ticket or don't have a go card, you will be fined $261. This is important later. The moment I stepped off the tram, go card in one hand and bag in the other, Entitled Mom tackled me and the Entitled Kid tried to take my bag. Before he got away, I kicked him in the back leg and he falls. I quickly got up, grabbed my bag from the ground and bolted. I tapped on the ticket scanner and ran for the stairs. Entitled Mom tries to run after me, shouting, Thief! Thief! But is stopped by security. She had ran past the ticket scanners without scanning a ticket. One of the officers tells me to come over. As I approached, the Entitled Mom was shouting, saying I was a thief and should be in jail. I told the officer my side of the story, and he also asked for CCTV footage and eyewitnesses. Both showed and said that I was in the right and that Entitled Mom is a big fat liar. They took her away, and not only did her and her son not have any valid tickets and were fined, while she was screaming like a banshee, I went with my day, knowing that Karen was in deep trouble. If you think this story is fake, I have an image of the laptop cover here. Nice, I, I see why Entitled Kid wanted it. Next up we've got the Entitled Jerk Speed Round. Okay, so I work for Walmart in a city near Dallas, Texas. I work in lawn and garden, so that puts me on the receiving end of entitled people as a cashier, customer service, and as a sales associate. I have never had a huge blowout of any one person that really stands with me over the years I have worked there, but I have had entitled people thinking they can get away with anything, and I don't take crap from anyone anymore in my life. Listening to Mr. Reddit every day keeps me a bit more on the sane side because I hear the worst Karens out there and think, you know. My job ain't so bad, really. But I still get them, so I am putting together the entitled Karen speed round. The cast will be myself, and either Karen or Kevin in each round. Coworker will be a coworker. We get these people just about every day. Okay, enough rambling. Here we go. Round one. Hey, can I get this plant free? It's almost dead. I mean, just look at it. Ma'am, that plant is already marked down. I can't give plants away, so we mark them down to half price when the first bloom falls off. But I want it for less. I mean, just look at it. I am looking at it. I am also looking at the bright yellow sticker I put on it that says it's half off. So, it's half off this price? Good, I'll take it. No, ma'am. This is the half off price. So, can I just take it for free? You're going to throw it away anyway if I don't take it. I'm face palming. Repeat ad nauseum. Round two. I or coworker is helping a customer on the sales floor. At times we are completely alone taking care of the garden center and this happens. Excuse me, but can you tell me where? Insert product here. Is? Mid conversation with another customer. Sure, it's in aisle X on the left hand side going back to explaining something to first customer. Can you show me where it is? I can in a few minutes, or when I am finished here. But I need it now! Ma'am, I'm helping this person, and you are looking for solar lights. It's an entire aisle of solar lights. You can't miss it. Karen leaves in a huff, grumbling and ignoring the fact I am already helping someone. Round 3. I'm on the register, and I get these questions usually when I have three people in line. Check this price for me. 
I am in the middle of checking out another customer. There was no price on this. Does that mean it's free? Seriously, never do this. We want to slap everyone that thinks this is clever. I can't believe how long this takes. Why can't you check people out faster? We don't have a belt out here, and thus we are not well equipped to take an overflowing cart of groceries from the other side of the store. I have actually said this, and it felt so good. Well, I parked over here. Not my problem. I want to check the prices on all these pre-marked clearance items. Priced as marked. Oh, I don't want it then. Repeat this for more than half of their cart. This was how much? Oh, that is far too much. It says $1.25. Sir, that is the you save price for a marked down item. See the you pay in black bold text next to where it says $3.75? Well, can you give it to me for $1.25? It says $1.25. No. Oh, never mind then. Round four. We also run the seasonal department, and every year we get these. I will prelude for each season starting with the first season. Valentine's Day. So it's Valentine's Day. Why isn't your candy marked down? Because it's still the holiday. They get marked down tomorrow. But tomorrow is too late. I need to buy my wife a gift now. I face palm. Easter. Do you have any plain baskets left? Ma'am. It's two days before Easter. We were sold out three weeks ago. Well, when are you getting more in? We aren't. <coughs> Summer toys. Can you fit this 20-foot pool inside my car? What kind of car do you drive? Gives me the name of a small vehicle. There's no way it's gonna fit. Can you hold it for me so I can go back and get my truck? Face palm. Not unless you pay for it. Then we can leave it behind the service desk. But I don't want to pay for it now. I want to pay for it when I come back with my truck. I want to ask why they didn't just drive their truck to the store in the first place, but I digress. Fourth of July and every grilling holiday. Where is the charcoal? Sir, you walked past three pallets of charcoal on your way here, and there is a wall of charcoal in the garden center. I'm so sick of this question. I gave up being PR about it. I don't know why I still have a job. Back to school. Find me everything on my kid's school list. I can't. I have to help everyone. I can show you where things are. You can't find. Well, I can't find anything. Help me. I'm not kidding. This doesn't just happen once a year. This is every single year. Every single day. They don't even try. Halloween. Do you have any costumes? Me, trying to keep a smile on. Yes, ma'am. Right behind you. Well, you don't need to be so rude. Christmas. Do you have any 12-foot trees? Sir, it's December 20th. They were sold out in October and November. How about 9-foot trees? Everything over 7 feet were sold out in October and November. You really need to shop for the bigger trees early. It's crazy how fast they sell out. Well, that's stupid. You should stock more. We order more every year. They still sell out very early. So, are you trying to tell me you have no 9 foot or 10 foot trees? Yup, that's right. Go check in the bag. Face palm. Final round. Can you mark this down for me? No ma'am, those just came in. That's why the plant racks are still wrapped in plastic. Fine then, I'll get someone else to mark it down. 10 minutes later. Coworker. Hey, Corsi Husky. I have a customer that wants a plant marked down. Can we... No, don't talk to him. Get a manager. Me nodding. Go ahead, it's fine. Ten minutes later, manager comes out to garden and finds me. Hey, Corsi Husky, uh, can we mark this plant down? No, those just came in off the truck. We haven't even checked them in yet. I want the store manager. You people are useless. 15 minutes later and, you guessed it, store manager. Hey, Corsi. Forget it then. Why does everyone keep coming to you? Because I am the department manager. I am the one that marks plants down and I told you they just came off the truck. Oh, that's the new truck? Yes, we can't mark those down yet. Store manager turns to me. Where are your markdowns? 
back corner racks where they always are. I can show her where they are, no problem. I have a ton of markdowns. Thank you, Corsi Husky. At this point, refer to round one. We get this kind of crap all the time. Don't get me wrong, I love my job. I just wish people would have a little common sense instead of entitlement. And our final story of the day. Entitled Aunt tries to ruin our amazing wedding by burning the place. So, okay, this may be a long one. Also, I'm on mobile, blah, blah, blah. So me and my wife have been going out for years. We both finished college, so we got engaged. Now my wife is Bulgarian and she is a really nice human. Since this is happening in England and our families are in opposite sides of Europe, we wanted to have two weddings. One in England with my family and parents and another with her family and her parents. Here we had a normal wedding, but there she wanted a traditional Bulgarian one. She asked me beforehand and of course I agreed. That was like a tradition that was passed down from generation to her, so it was something special. That meant we needed to do it where her parents and grandparents and so on had their wedding. The middle of a mountain. Okay, so we get plane tickets and me and my parents and my wife fly all the way to Bulgaria. We would be sleeping in our parents' apartment. No need for a hotel. We are leaving for the hut in early morning. Morning comes, it's 5 a.m. We wake up. Her father is driving one of those black trucks. Turns out we need to get most of her relatives and that's a lot, and I mean a lot of people. Now I see why we were in a truck. Anyways, we get her grandparents, sister, and then we go pick up Entitled Aunt. The moment she sits, everyone is silent. Dead silent. I understand a bit of Bulgarian, so I understand when her father asks her why she was invited. Apparently, my wife is such a nice cookie, she invited her. So I'm sparing the travel. There were tears as she hasn't seen most of her family for three years. Entitled Aunt didn't really say much. So finally we are there. It's like a cabin in the woods that's owned by her grandparents. And no, we are having the wedding in the woods, not the cabin. So in this actually big cabin, the whole family is shoved in there. The men drank something called rakia, and everyone was having a blast. Keep in mind, not all of her relatives speak or even understand English. Yes, it was a fun night, no doubt. An entitled aunt is nowhere to be seen on the dinner table. So tomorrow noon, we are having the wedding. Grandparents gave me a traditional wedding suit, and she was wearing her grandmother's dress. Not exactly, but you get the point. So we go in the forest and we start the wedding. Kind of hard to explain what's going on because I had no idea. But she was happy, so I was too. And here comes Entitled Aunt to ruin everything. So we are all there singing around the fire. And here is what happened from translations I got after from my wife. Ugh, this English monkey has no idea what he was even singing. He doesn't know Bulgarian, but it's fine. Why did you need to marry an English monkey like him? Sorry, what? While there were still tribes, Bulgarians were making gold rings and jewelry. Look at them now. Dutch, a nice country. Uh, now I knew something was wrong since, you know. What's wrong? I will tell you later. The family was all silent. But seriously. My wife's sister started arguing with Entitled Dan. Not sure what happened, but Entitled Ant stood up and got a dry branch, got it heated in the fire, and threw the branch in the dry grass. The grass lit up instantly. Everyone who was trying to actually calm down Entitled Ant before were now freaking out. I didn't mention this earlier, but this woman was so lazy. While everyone was prepping food, she was sitting in the house on her phone. Men and women were working together and she just screamed at the kids who were playing around to stop because apparently they were going to hurt themselves. Keep in mind, they grew up there. So after the wedding, when it came time to give gifts, that woman demanded that she also gets one. Um, what? She first tries to burn the place where generations upon generations had their amazing moment, and now she's demanding a gift? A gift? She started whining like a child. Family members were telling her how she isn't getting married and she isn't getting anything. Entitled Aunt raged and went back again to the cabin. Afterwards, when we were all again in a good mood, we went back to the cabin to find it locked. It was getting dark. Dark and there are wolves and even bears here. An Entitled Aunt was sleeping peacefully in her room. So yeah, one kid found an open window and opened it from the inside. And when we asked Entitled Aunt about it, she said, I quote, 
I didn't lock it. It was probably those stupid kids of yours. My father-in-law says, the kids were with us at the altar. It was very windy last night. And it somehow not only closed the door, but also turned the key? Entitled Aunt was shut down. She didn't apologize, and she didn't give us a gift. My wife still loved the wedding, though. And shoutouts to our re generals of the day, Rita Acklin, Michael Hauser, and Anne Swan. Become tomorrow's re generals by leaving as many re's as you can in the comments below.